like we're going to make some improvements in there. thankful, Father, for the privilege to discuss things that might benefit us as well as our loved ones in the nation and the state as a whole. Heavenly Father, we would ask for all the sin that we commit against thee. Forgive us, Father, and we, as the source of all things, in our discussions today, may the thing that we say and do be pleasing for Jesus' sake. Amen. <coughs> We do have a quorum present. Uh, we'll be able to transact business. Got a lot of conflict and a lot of bad weather. Several members of the board have already advised us they wouldn't be able to be at the meeting. Malgamay Clothing Workers are having a stamp meeting. Each in Nashville and James Jackson and Merrill Davis. To have to end that, and then the roads were iced over pretty good. Brother Edwards called yesterday and said he was going to try to get in. Brother Brown sick with the flu, and uh, I don't know what the trouble is with several other members. Mark was supposed to be here, didn't you? Yeah, I talked to you yesterday morning. We haven't heard from Marvin, so maybe some of them might show up as we. As we get started, called me in the office yesterday on our double hookup. How'd y'all arrange that? I done both on the phone at the same time. Him and Corinth and Edwards and Cooper. And I was, uh, he's the first guy I saw in the hotel this morning and uh, it was the last one I saw. I didn't know how he was going to get out. <laughs> well, anyhow, we'll uh, continue with the meeting. We have a number of things we'd like to discuss with you. Uh, one, I guess we should... Uh, Read the minutes of the last executive committee meeting. Have all of you had a chance to read those minutes? Tom, how about you read them? And uh, there might be some question or something somebody might want to raise. Business to 
motion in favor of the nine is the motion to the We would like to meet the Supreme Court District with the board appointed to the Legislative Research Commission. The committee discussed this with the paper, but this constitutes that it was provided. However, adopted motion that we oppose to the Legislative Research Commission at this time. County Unit System B and C design motion was adopted to support the creation of county units. That should be units, shouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah units. Typographical error. And that the supervised district be apportioned to one man, one vote, on one man, one vote basis. B and C four. That was correct in discussion. Committee of adopted motion that we take no position on the matters of JP courts. But if the job is maintained, the fee should district should be about set up on a salary basis with qualifications rate. Unemployment insurance and workers' compensation were also discussed by the committee. Let us remember the state of the trust. There was a good possibility of getting legislation passed in the 1968 legislative session, eliminating the maximum payment for unemployment insurance and eliminating the seven-day waiting period. The committee stated that we would work towards getting labor's representative reappointed to the workers' compensation committee. Raising death benefits from 18,000 to 18,000 and put workers' comp bill back where the workers' compensation back where it was before 1960. The committee advised Judge Ramsey to not become involved in the contract with Speaker of the House. The conference held at Mississippi State University related to the establishment of the Department of Industrial Relations was discussed by the committee. Motion was adopted that we submit a resolution of 1968 Biennial Convention in support of Sam. Judge Ramsey discussed the formation of the joint council in this nominated case. The council is designed to further the teaching of economics in our high schools and colleges. All segments of the community are represented on the council. Motion was adopted to support the creation of this council. The committee discussed the distribution of the citizen's guide to book in large quantities to the various high schools over the state and the high cost of postage involved. The committee agreed that the book that should be distributed free of cost to the school but picked up the state council office. It was suggested that we send a copy of the book to all public libraries in the state. Secretary of Treasury denied Vice President Taylor to review the 1967 fire booth activity for the committee. Motion was adopted that we sponsor the fire booth again in 1968. President Ramsey asked the committee to recommend possible speakers for the 1968 convention and several international union presidents were suggested. The motion for the meeting then recessed at 2.45 p.m. with the vice president to remain to study the pension retirement plan. The meeting of the full committee reconvened at 5 p.m. Vice President Jackson, chairman of the Pension and Insurance Committee, advised the group of his committee and reviewed the various plans the other state council had come to the conclusion that the Arkansas plan could best be adapted to our situation. Arkansas has a severance pay plan whereby the state AFL-CIO has set up serving arrangements for each council employee. The plan calls for a matching arrangement whereby the council of each employee contributes a percentage of their salary to the fund each month. The committee was of the opinion that 2.5% was as far as the Mississippi AFL-CIO could go at the present time. The committee further agreed, further felt that an arrangement should be made whereby credit would be given for past service. President Ram, the secretary, and I agreed with the committee and complimented them for their work. After considerable discussion, the full executive committee agreed that the matter should be tabled until after the next convention. In the meantime, it was agreed to consult with the Office Workers Union and Stanton Smith, coordinator of local and state central body. President Ram then advised the committee that he had received a telephone call from Laurel during the recess, advising him a group of citizens in Laurel who were raising money to replace property and other items lost by Reverend Alan Johnson when his home was bombed. President Ram then pointed out that Reverend Johnson had been working very closely with the Mississippi AFL-CIO voter registration program and gave him credit for much of the progress made to date. The motion was adopted by unanimous vote of the state 
that's the state FLC I offered Trevor $100 and Johnson the Pump. There being no further business to come before the committee, the meeting was adjourned to 6 p.m. Do we have any questions concerning the minutes of the committee meeting? By any member of the board that's not on the committee. Anything that's not too clear here, yeah, well, we'll see if we can't clear it up for you. Yeah, well, <clears throat> if you remember, uh, when this Constitution Amendment was up uh, during the Barnett administration, we uh, we and uh, several other groups and what have you opposed it because we uh, we felt that uh, we'd have a stacked board by Barnett. Uh, since that time, uh, there's been a uh, a change in the atmosphere and what have you in the state. The MEC has been <coughs> has been pushing for a lay board of education appointed <coughs> by the governor uh, on staggered terms. When well, this board would be charged with the responsibility of naming the state superintendent of education. Well, after quite a bit of discussion, the executive committee uh, felt that there was a need for an expanded lay board, but that that board should be elected by the people instead of appointed by the governor, three of them from each, uh, each uh, Supreme Court district. A lot of this uh, thinking uh, goes back to the Booz Allen report and their recommendations on uh, some changes in the educational set up here in the state. Bob and Johnson, I might say, uh, the newly elected <coughs> uh, president of the, well, the newly elected state superintendent of education, rather, uh, along with the MEA, that's his teacher's organization have also come out in favor of the expanded lay board of education, which that group opposed the thing along with us before you know. This is a completely different setup, yeah. as I understand it from what the original proposition was. Right? Yeah. This is elected members against the original appointed members. Yeah. Uh, as is, you know what you got now, the setup now with the, with the State Superintendent of Education, the Secretary of State, and the Attorney General comprising the, the uh, board. Uh, everybody is of the opinion that we that we really need a lay board of education. The, the question really is how do you go about getting it? Should it be appointed or should it be elected? And uh, most people that have given this thing uh, real serious thought agree that it would be best to have the State Superintendent of Education an appointed official. Well, they think that you can uh, uh, come up with a better qualified person this way. That's the thing. Uh, Well, uh, this might be true too. Uh, I think you abolish your elected position and make it a pony by you uh, cutting down them on the democratic process. That's true too, and then anything is uh, essential as education for the state of Mississippi today. You've got professional people that would accept appointments that would not get involved in politics as far as a campaign is concerned. I think this is, uh, would really boil down to being the difference. 
whether you could get a qualified man in an educational position to accept an appointment with a fixed salary rather than to go out and uh, stump the state uh, for the job. What'd you say? With a nine, with a nine-member board yeah. being elected, that gives you a bigger uh, vote. Yeah. Right. Is there any way? Well, I was thinking of the committee that, that the thing that you're talking about would be safeguarded with the board being elected instead of appointed. You see. And this, uh, this is the, uh, this is the debate that's going on in the minds of the legislature right now, as to whether or not this thing should be on an elective basis or on an appointed basis, you see. Uh, I think if you've got a board that's elected by the people, then you, you do safeguard the democratic process that you're talking about. And this is something, of course, that concerned us very much before when we opposed this thing. That Booz Allen report, by the way, is, is, a, is a very interesting reading. I've got a copy of it in the office. And, uh, any of you'd like to read it sometime, I'd be glad to loan it to you. But it's interesting to note that, that the Booz Allen Report recommends just about everything that this organization's ever recommended. That they're pretty well going down the line with, uh, with our views on, on the need to improve education and what have you in the state of Mississippi. That includes teachers' salaries, the tax structure, and, and everything. You know what I mean? Well, do we have any other <coughs> questions on the minutes? On any of the other items? Well, there's, there's one thing I'd like to ask on this, in this workman's comp. Yes. Uh, the elimination of the maximum payment for unemployment insurance. Uh, I know there's a limit on it now, but. Yeah. We, uh, uh, we're talking there about removing that $30 maximum in the law. As it stands now, nobody can draw over $30 a week. And uh, uh, the formula in the law is not bad, but it's, uh, at the end, uh, where it says, spells out the formula, it says something to this effect, provided, however, no one shall receive over $30 a week, you see. Now, what we're trying to do is remove that maximum where the formula will take over. Uh, and according to a man's wages, or how the average wage might increase, then he would receive more each uh, week as the thing improved this you know, each year. Now, we have met with the Employment Security Commission. Uh, Bill Stanley and myself serve on the advisory committed to the commission, and uh, we had a meeting out there a few weeks ago to review uh, proposed changes. The MEC, the manufacturers, and everybody else were out there but trying to convince the commission to make recommendations to the legislature to improve uh, this particular law. And I was talking with uh, Walter Bevins just a couple of days ago to find out if they had made a decision yet. And he advises me that they are going to make, a re make recommendations to this effect, that the formula be changed to 50% in the law, which is now 55%. The maximum be raised to $42 in 1968, the $43 in 1969, and that the maximum be eliminated beginning of 1970 and the formula take over. Give me those years again. Maximum. All right. Maximum will be changed to $42. That's from $30 to $42 in, in 1968. Forty three dollars in nineteen sixty nine. And the maximum then would be eliminated from the law and the formula would take over, which means that according to the average wage the person would draw fifty percent from that point on. Which means that the weekly benefits would fluctuate according to the average wage. Uh, the minimum <coughs> minimum will be raised for, raised from eight dollars to twelve dollars, 
and uh, they're not going to recommend elimination to wait and they appear at this time. That will still remain seven dollars. I mean, seven days. Seven days will still be there. Now, this is there. Of course, now that don't mean that we're tied down on this. That we can push to eliminate the waiting period and and uh, drop the maximum and let the formula take over immediately. It don't mean that we're bound by this, but their recommendation will carry a certain amount of weight with the legislature. You know. But this will be a vast improvement in what we've got already. I'm sure all of you agree to that. Wage, just the average wage in the state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is it now? What does it run now, Tom? What did it tell us out there about $87, wasn't it? Uh, $88. That's, that, we got an innocent situation here, fellas. <laughs> $88. Well, this is the, the average wage. We have an innocent situation. Let me let me show you fellas something. Everybody get a pass this round. I know you've all seen the fifty percent of the state rather than your own local. Yeah. One to be looking at. Uh, it'd be forty-four dollars if they write the law. You got one there, Dee? You got two there? Oh, that's Let me let me show you first something. <coughs> Turn over and the legislative. Uh, well, we uh, number three. Increase unemployment insurance. Maximum benefits should be raised from thirty dollars to forty dollars per week, uh, and from twenty-six to thirty-nine weeks, and so forth and so on. Uh, this is most unfortunate that we got this brochure out before we got uh, the improvements in the uh, average wage. Here, this this program here was. Huh? <laughs> you got one that's right on it? It ain't printed on the back. Let's see what you... You've got a bad one, huh? See? <laughs> we'll run into that. Huh? Well, you have it. Ain't nothing on the back? Well, how about that? Let's send that one back to the printer. He didn't run that one through the second time. Make him give us another. Yeah. Hmm. But anyhow, what I'm, what I'm getting at is that... Uh, this uh, legislative program, you remember, was uh, we updated it at our last convention, and we just adopted what had already been our program on unemployment insurance and did not make uh, any adjustments or changes in it. Now we find ourselves <laughs> in a position that the commission is recommending more than what we've been trying to do, you see. <laughs> if we'd have had this information, that we picked up out at the commission, uh, you see, <laughs> we would have got this thing up to date. But when I got that, I says, my God, look at the shape we're in now. Well, we're out there and we found out to don't go the average way. Yes, right. Uh, Brother Ralph, is there anything in, in uh, being proposed that would uh, amend the present act on the uh, misconduct Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you were you was out of Robert was at the hearing and Tom uh, presented our uh, position and spent quite a bit of time on this word misconduct and how it's uh, misused. And after having quite a discussion with Walter Bevins and other members of the staff out there, it was. Uh, agreed that the best thing to do is to have a meeting of the staff, the people responsible for administering the law back at these local offices, and review with them what the proper interpretation of the law is, uh, that it's virtually impossible to come up with language to do what we think, you see. Now, we've got, they've got several rulings already. Uh, we carried up one case uh, for fellow involved in a campaign that Ray Smithart had up in uh, Batesville, I believe it was, where he had been fired for union activities, denied his unemployment insurance because of misconduct, and the misconduct was his activity in organizing, see. And we pointed out that this guy was his right to do this was protected by law and that the, that the uh, act itself clearly stated, you know, that this would not was not misconduct. Anyhow, 
uh, it's, it was their thinking, and, and we agreed with them, that uh, if they would call a meeting of the people responsible for ministering the law and have an understanding about what misconduct really was, you see, then that uh, we could probably go along with this. But it's the most difficult task, really, to try to say what you want to and make this change in this law, right, Tom? We have got very good uh, cooperation out there with the people at the state office level. And I might suggest to you that any time you have a strike in your area, the first thing you should do is to call the local employment office and advise them that, uh, that you have a legitimate work stoppage uh, in order that they won't be referring people to that plant. Uh, quite often, when we have a strike, the employment office is not made aware of it. The employer will contact the, the employment office and ask them to refer people out there for work, see. We had this happen down in Brookhaven just this past week. The planters have a plant down there they organized, couldn't get a contract, and wound up striking it last week. And they immediately contact the employment office, ask them to refer a certain number of people out. And of course, the employment office didn't know the plant was struck. The representative for the painter called me and told me that there'd been a guy out there. So I didn't do nothing to pick up the phone, call Walter Bevins, and told him that we had a strike. We'd appreciate it if he'd notify the people. Well, it just so happened that a man from Brookhaven was there, and he got on it right away, and assured us there would not be anybody referred to the plant. But quite often, this is our fault. We don't think about advising the employment office that a work stoppage exists, you see. Do we have any other discussion on these minutes or anything in the minutes? If not, do we have a motion to adopt the minutes? That they be approved? Have a second. Any further discussion? Not all in favor of the motion signify for saying aye. aye. All opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. I've got a number of items here that uh, <coughs> we want to call your attention to, and then I'm sure that some of you might have some matters you want to present to the meeting. Uh, I've been contacted this past week about a so-called labor paper in Pascagoula. Uh, and Robbie will probably want to advise us more about that. That solicited an advertising round about the state, uh, supposedly telling the prospected advertisers that, uh, that this is an official labor publication. We've had uh, inquiries from the Better Business Bureau, several of them here in our office, about this publication, and we didn't know anything about it until this past week, frankly. And we advised those people, as far as we knew, that this was a phony paper, and they should not spend their money with it. It wasn't speaking for organized labor, especially in Mississippi. Now, uh, the business agent for Local 733 IBW in Pascagoula, Mr. Massey, called this past week, and I was out when he called. But when I got back in, I returned the call and talked to one of his assistants, and he advised me that they have an office set up in that building down there and have telephones all up and down the walls where they're soliciting advertising. 
I asked him to send us a copy of the paper in. And I understood that the CLU will be taking this matter up shortly and that you'll probably uh, take a position or let us know something about it, you know, as to what the CLU uh, feels. And uh, it might well be that we'll have to get some communications out and let the people know that this paper is, is not legitimate and does not have the support of the labor movement. But before we do anything in this office, I think the Jackson Central, the Jackson County Central Labor Union should initiate it since it's in their town. Well, I can give you what little information I uh, have, Frank, which is practically none. I do know that the paper exists, it's being mailed out there, and there's advertisements are being solicited, but the paper is published in Florida. And I know where this office is, but then as far as the CLU was concerned, they never consulted the CLU the first time or any member at their office I know of. It's never been mentioned to us. In fact, Floyd asked me about it. It's the first time that anybody has directly mentioned it to me. Yeah. What's the name of the paper right there? I understood it was put out with by the retail clerks. Have you oh, seen a copy of it? News. The Labor Union News. Retail clerks automobile? boy that I talked to with uh, an IBW office said uh, they had one out. Well, it's not in the IBW building, it's that building joint. Oh, it's not in the IBW building? Oh, I see. I thought he said it was downstairs in there. <coughs> no, it's a building joint. I see. What does it say? What does it say on the map? It says, uh, uh, Robert E. Alexander, look at it right What does it say? I really don't know. I couldn't tell you. seen copy of the thing? I think they don't have anything on about it being endorsed by the local union or anything. Yeah, I didn't see it as far as I didn't read the local. No, but they sell an advertisement. Let me ask the committee this, or the board this. Uh, uh, is it agreeable for the board that when and if the Jackson County group uh, takes action in opposition to this publication that we should follow through on it to the state council office and let the business community know and suggest that they not spend their money with this publication? Now, this is not the first time we've had this kind of a problem. We've had so to deal with it before. You've got these legislative reports coming out. Yeah. It wouldn't cost you much to get yeah. that room on one of them. But, uh, right. Uh, well, we'll do that, uh, of course, uh, and, uh, with our own organization, certainly. But I'm thinking about the people that they're putting the bite on in the business community. Quite often, uh, they'll what they do is, you know, tell them that this is a, an official labor publication. Uh, and if you don't take out ads with us, uh, 
uh, you know, that we're going to put the screws on you and ask uh, labor people not to do business with you. This is the way they play the game. I remember back before I left them down there that we had this situation, and we we made them a proposition, if I remember then, that we would endorse the publication if they advertised only union shops and union goods. And when we made that proposition, they left. They didn't realize there wouldn't be all that much money in it, see? Right? Well, that, that, plus I remember Pat Sullivan getting into the act for a long time, and he was more or less recommended it until somebody would pin him down. <laughs> I think probably they might have made a proposition to Pat so much a month. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine probably all uh, four Then you've been having some good meetings lately. Right, and so we want an issue like this come up and hear Right. Well, if it's agreeable with the board, we'll wait and see what Jackson County Central Labor Union does, and then we'll cooperate with them and follow through on this. Is this all right? Okay. Uh, one or Again, uh, talk to you about speakers for the convention and see if uh, you got any suggestions from anyone that wasn't at the committee meeting. I can advise you up to this point who all's been invited. Uh, and some of the, our thinking up here, uh, and this of course ties in with our last exec committee meeting when we discussed the matter. We have written Miss Buddy Furness, who is in charge of consumer affairs for the president, who Tom heard at the AFL-CO convention, who I understand makes a very good address. Uh, we haven't heard from her yet, but uh, I've communicated with the New Orleans office, and they've agreed to set up a booth at the fair and suggested if we can't get Betty Furness, we get uh, Maureen Newberger, former senator from Oregon, who has also been active in this area of consumer affairs. I have written Joe Keenan, Jack. We haven't heard from him yet. I've written Paul Phillips. Uh, Bill Kircher has assured us that he'll be here. He's the director of organization for the FLCIO. Stanton Smith said he'd be here if at all possible. Dr. Moore, here in Mississippi, who directs the mental health program uh, has advised me that she would be glad to be on our program. I might say that this mental health thing is something that I think that we need to become very concerned about and become active in if at all possible. Uh, then we thought that we would probably get Evelyn Gandy, the state treasurer, all of you know. That would give us one prominent woman speaker each day, Betty Furness, Dr. Moore, and Evelyn Gandy. Uh, I thought we would invite the Lieutenant Governor, uh, probably the State Superintendent of Education, maybe the Attorney General will want your views on this. Then I thought we ought to give some thought to a few members of the legislature appearing on the program, some members that we supported. We've got a number over there that I'm sure would be willing to. We've got Merle now, who is the pro-tem in the Senate. We might think about putting him on the program. 
Theodore Smith from Corinth, who I know would like to be on the program. And Brother Clark suggested outside this morning that we might ought to think about put Mrs. White, one of his senators from that area, uh, who is a woman, another would be another woman speaker. Then we would probably want to give some thought to uh, inviting Robert Clark to for his Negro in the legislature. I have a few words to say. Does anyone here now have any suggestions other than these? <clears throat> anyone that you'd like to invite that we haven't mentioned? We're trying to get uh, a few national people, you see, some of our good people here in the state, and of course, some, uh, Kircher would be the main guy out of the FLC. Our last time, if you remember, we got Bill Schnitzel as the secretary. I'm treasurer. Sure you're here for a year, sir. Brother Keenan and me. Yeah. I, I can sit and listen to him half a day at a time. Well, he's a good speaker, no question about that. And he he knows what we're trying to do. And he was down here, well, how long ago has it been, Jack? A couple of years ago? Two or three years. A couple of three years ago. And he went over to the office and was very impressed with with our equipment and everything we're trying to do. Do you have anyone have any other suggestions or comments on, on the speaker situation? I was just wondering about maybe one of the rubber workers, uh, president or vice president maybe. One of Obama reader. Uh, yeah. Or I'd be happy to write him and see if we can get one of them. Either uh, one of them would be fine. Uh, what is the president's name? Peter Obama reader. Obama reader. How you spell that? Well, we'll look it up. Uh -oh. Let's see right. if well, I know who's okay. I know he's, he's got a long Well, it would be good, I think, to get uh, through this. Rubble workers are beginning to make a lot of progress in this state. I think you've got about nine locals here now. By the way, I've been invited to be on a program you're going to have here next month. They're having a, 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 an officers meeting of some kind here on the 4th of February. And uh, your education department has been in touch with us, and I've Sure, they might we'd cooperate. <coughs> yeah, well, we'll do that. We got any other suggestions? Sir, yes. Uh, in the minutes of the executive meeting, of December 15, who were those uh, fellow international unions uh, presidents that The ones we just reviewed with you. Uh, those were international unions. Well, there's three there. Actually, I didn't identify them by union. Uh, Kenan is not the president of IBW, Secretary of Treasury, but he was recommended by Brother Schaefer and uh, somebody else I think thought it would be a good idea. And I He's a better speaker than Gordon Freeman. That's yeah. Why. Yes. <laughs> and I wanted to get Paul Phillips down here. He's now he's the president of the paper makers. Uh, he's never been here since I've been president. I think it's about time he came. And and uh, that would now if we get uh, we can get somebody out of the rubber workers, that would give us a pretty good uh, uh, international union uh, representation, right? Yeah, I thought it just occurred to me, uh, Claude, that since this is a national <coughs> election year, yeah. there's apparently a lot of the internationals, if not all of them, are putting a lot of emphasis on COVID. Yeah. Be possible to get the director. Of See, we can get Al Barkin. We can make a stab at it. Let me put him down. I'll see if I can get him. I'd like to say that he'll come if he can. I'm yeah. sure, but uh, he's going to be money business. in a dollar on each member of COPE already this year. For Sixty-eight. <coughs> ever done that? So How about that? Take it out. They didn't take it out of the general fund. We had an education recreation. Good. Better receipt on your members for Yeah. Well, now, I've hope books, I will. <laughs> at our last board meeting, uh, that was a full board meeting. That was prior to the COPE convention. Uh, I understood that you wanted to try to arrange the agenda where we'd have some time during the day when the legislature was in session uh, that we would that we'd recess. Uh, 
uh, and give uh, the delegates an opportunity to visit the Capitol. Uh, I assume you still want the agenda arranged in that fashion, right? I'm glad to have the banquet set away. Huh? I thought the banquet was going to take place. Well, we agreed to have the banquet too, but they, they were still. Uh, you still want to have some time to visit the Capitol, right? That means that's going to cut down on the uh, number of speakers and what have you if we if we cut uh, some of the time out for that. See, we well, I think if we visit the Capitol, we ought to go in the booth, not go to the yeah. Sandra all up there. Right. This is going to be hard to do too the way that the House meets the next well, and the Senate in the morning. Yeah, of course, what we'll have to do one morning is to uh, recess the convention probably a about 11 o'clock in order that you can visit the Senate and uh, and adjourn early one afternoon from the visit to the House. See, the Senate convenes at 10 o'clock in the morning as a rule and the House at about 2 in the afternoon. The House committee is working in the morning and the full House meet in the afternoon and then the Senate meets in the morning. They'll take care of their business and then recesses and the and the committees go to work, you see. That's the way they operate over there. What night have you got planned or have you thought about Tuesday that? night for the banquet. The banquet. Yes. Well, that's a, in other words, that'll follow the uh, the, the dance always happens, so it'll have the dance to follow that then. Well, I'm at you so you gotta keep in mind too your nomination and election of officers are stated in the convention at certain times. Yeah, continue that for the next two years and we can skip that. See the <laughs> See, that's part of the problem here is that the Constitution says uh, on, uh, on what day, you see, when you start working up this agenda, you have, to, you have to remember the Constitution spells out the time and the day that nominations will take place, the time and the day that elections will take place, and you have to arrange your agenda around all of this, you see. Now, if we recess uh, part of a day to go to the legislature, that... Uh, that's going to create another problem. Well, you may have to extend it another day. I'd have to. Uh, call for the nominations at 2 uh, on, uh, on Tuesday. Yes. This means you can adjourn at 10, 30, 11, and go to the Senate, come back, go into session at 2 o'clock, and then after that you can recess again. Recess, and the, to the house. recess again for the House? Well, that, that's going to kill just about a full day when you do that. Are you going to get your delegates in and Huh? Well, that's the secretary's job. You think I'm going to get them back in here? What's this? You don't think we'd ever get them back together? Yeah, no. I think we're going to run into more problems. I didn't do what it's worth. What would be worth? Well, it... Huh? Since you don't have your bank. Yeah, but if I did was, that a lot of people have never been to the Capitol and never seen the legislature. You about an extra day to open this? Yeah. We might have to set it up on a four-day basis. Yeah, I don't know. Like might have to. Yeah. Might have to. We might have to. Well, say three and a half days, maybe. Go over there when the people go over there. Won't be any trouble in getting that done. We got several over there that'd be happy to do that. Tell you, I'm a little optimistic about this thing. We, I think we're in pretty good shape in the legislature this time. Bill Miner told me the other day, he's a correspondent for the Times Picker Union, that we got more friends over there than he's ever seen before. I said, well, that ain't no accident. We, we done a little work in this election. <laughs> I wonder if we could get the same job done by just making this an item of convention business on the fourth day. What is that? The, the visit to the huh? The visit to the the ones that want to stay over could, huh? Right. Maybe that's the way to do that. Now, thing. if they come down with this known as it is a part of the convention, mm -hmm. uh, the local unions might uh, consent to it and say stay over. It might be the way to handle that thing. Uh, in other words, you shouldn't, hmm? you shouldn't close the convention out until after until Wednesday. That's right. Afternoon. No. Thursday. Thursday. Afternoon. Thursday. Thursday. Afternoon. Thursday. Yeah. After this day is over, just reassemble for comments and close the convention. I 
might be the best way to handle it. But. Does this mean we'd have to send out a memorandum to all the affiliates uh, that the uh, uh, schedule has been an added day of convention? Uh, Well, we can arrange it. We can yeah, arrange it. it. Uh, we yeah. can arrange it. <laughs> He's done been down there since Friday. <laughs> we can <laughs> arrange it. Is this, is this, this agreeable with the with the board now that we that we consider this and uh, setting up the agenda on next today? Huh? Yeah, I like that business. Do you? You like it, Robbie? Yeah. You, Robbie? Yes, sir. Okay, that's probably the answer to it. We'll uh, we'll certainly. Approach it in that fashion. Well, do you need a motion? Or yes, a give, motion? Us, give us give us some motion. Somebody state how they want to put in there. Uh, I will second it. The thing we discussed in here, in other words, is yeah. extending the convention to an extra day. To, well, there's nothing the in the days. Constitution requiring three days, but it's uh, just a matter of habit, we and it's really the problem with this body count. We might. Well, let's, uh, we might say that this this then would actually depend on hotel arrangements. We'd have to certainly clear this up. Boy, I tell you, that's not to worry about. Uh, maybe we should let uh, Brother Mike just if I straighten it out. He won't talk to me anyway. <laughs> Best, I don't talk to him right now. <laughs> maybe it's Brother Andrade. Well, let's put it this way: we we will try to give you at least a month's notice uh, on this matter if we have to go to the fourth day. It could be that we can work this thing out for three days. If we can, we'll do that. But if it looks like we need additional time, then we'll try to give you a month's notice. Is this pretty well agreeable? Okay. March. March the twenty-fifth, six and seven. Uh, if you come up with any suggested speakers now, anybody that you might come to mind after you leave, you drop us a note so we can get in touch with them. Huh? That's right, we had a motion here, didn't we? Uh, did you get the motion? You're not. <laughs> okay. All in favor of the motion to extend the convention to four days if necessary signify it by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, motion carried and so ordered. Uh, now, I have been in contact with the following people about booths. Uh, consumer Affairs will have one, Mental Health will have one, Social Security says they'll put up one, Minimum Wage says they'll put up one, and of course we'll have the usual union label display. Do you know of any other group or organization that we ought to contact and ask them if they'd like to put on a display? That would include brochures <coughs> and information concerning the organization. Uh, would be in way of getting anything from this, some of our uh, government agencies on their CEO and ours are. Office Economic Opportunity. Yeah, or our um, poverty program. All right. I'll make a note of that and see if they've got displays they put on. They might. Be a good idea. I'll contact them and see. Now, what? Uh, back to the convention speakers. Uh, Tom and I was talking about it the other day. 
what would you think about inviting Frank Smith, uh, who, who is the director of TVA, a former congressman from Mississippi, the last good one we had? Uh, what would you think about inviting him as a speaker? Frank makes a good uh, impression. Okay, then I'll contact Frank. Yes, I should have mentioned that. Yes, I should have mentioned that. We'll have, we'll have a representative from the university on the program who will explain that uh, that industrial relations department of the proposal. They are developing a brochure now uh, for use, and uh, when they get the brochure completed, they want invitations to appear before various groups to explain the whole thing. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I should have uh, should have brought that up. I had it down and overlooked it. Hello? Yes. Uh, back some years ago, in school, black and this and that, and dressing, and all things like that. Yeah. You got to somebody around you know that. Yeah. Explain it. Things like that. We've had a lot of organizing. I think I think uh, that they'd be glad to do it again, and I agree with you that you probably got a lot of young union officers now that probably need this thing. You uh, you thinking about now of um, of asking them to set up a series of district meetings similar to what they had before? Yeah, we'd be glad to contact them, and it uh, I just made a note here. We might also ask them to have a display over here of material, right? Yeah, they got quite a bit of material, so we'll we'll in, we'll ask them to set up uh, booths over here also. I think they'd be happy to do this again. Old uh, Krogh up at the, <coughs> the uh, office there in Nashville, I'm sure will be uh, glad to do that. All right, let's see. We've got uh, several other items we want to get some discussion and action on. You know, we've already discussed unemployment insurance and workman's compensation. Uh, we are also going to have a meeting with several members of the legislature uh, right away concerning the drafting of the Department of Labor bill. Uh, W.A. Stevens and uh, Marby Penton and Pascagoula are interested in this, but before we have a bill introduced, we want to get a meeting of the minds and make sure that, that the bill is what we want and that... Uh, that it's not stacked against us, so to speak. We'd be better off without a Department of Labor than some of these other states <laughs> have got. Make sure it won't be stated by MMA. Right, <laughs> right, that's right. Now, we got a couple of proposals. As a matter of fact, a couple of bills that's already been introduced that the council hasn't took a position on. Uh, and I think we should. Uh, one is... Uh, as lowering the voting age from 21 to 18. Uh, Theodore Smith has introduced this bill, uh, Brother Dees. Uh, we have uh, acted, uh, and our brochure calls for certain changes in the uh, election laws and what have you, but we've never actually took a position on this particular item, and we'd like to find out how you feel about that. I feel if a person's old enough to fight for this country at eight, uh, 18, he darn sure ought to have the right to vote. The only question, he doesn't have the same leadership. Huh? <laughs> the same leadership? Yeah. Yeah. 
I don't know. I have pretty mixed emotions. I think I, everybody I do does. Too, uh, uh, I share your feeling. It assumes the, the responsibility of endangering his life for the protection of the country. Certainly, you ought to have a voice in government. You maintain the freedom of the polls and the ballots. It's necessary. I'm not quite sure how stable a mind you're talking about in all cases of 18-year-olds. That's the point I was worried about. I just don't believe an 18-year-old can quite place things out as it should be. I mean, that's a, you got the two points there, but I see what you mean there. I, I'm worried about the, again, <coughs> in a this place to vote. Well, three years in the service, you can put some, some able by the time they are 20 You could 20 go back in. <laughs> well, I'll tell you fellas one thing. Uh, you spend a little time on the campus of these universities like I've been doing, and, and you'll find out that these kids are uh, darn sure uh, uh, sight sharper <coughs> and better informed on a lot of issues than, like you say, a lot of 39-year-olds right. are. Now, if you're not prepared... <coughs> To, to, you know, discuss a lot of pertinent issues. You'd better not get on a campus of one of these universities. Now, I spent three days up there not long ago, and uh, I guess I appeared before, <coughs> well, I started out at, uh, well, we start with, we had a labor uh, law thing at Ole Miss a couple of months ago. And then when uh, I went to MSCW, prior to this uh, thing in Mississippi State, then spent two days at Mississippi State and uh, addressed a number of classes there. And I'll tell you right now, those kids, and I guess they're probably 18 and 19 year old, most of them, they're pretty dog in uh, intelligent. Yes. Yes, sir. There ain't no question in my mind. So I don't have any, any, uh, there's not any serious question in my mind of what they wouldn't be intelligent voters. Well, I think really if you discuss it for 30 days, this, this same group for 30 days, we'd end up with something similar to this. But you're still talking about a majority. Now you can leave it at 21 and you've got an element that can't intelligently cast a ballot. Yeah. So if the majority of the 18-year-old or is stable or qualified to cast a ballot on basic issues, then yeah. I think it's progress in legislation. We have a number of states that have that, you know. state of Georgia's had uh, a lot of 18-year-olds to vote for several years now. It's not anything new or revolutionary or anything like that. Hmm? I don't know how many, just how many. We're going back to what Carl was talking about on the college campus. And this is true, though. This is what I find, that the kids at Mississippi State really are more pro-labor, open-minded, we'll say, than they are at, Miss, at, at Ole Miss. Well, I think it will continue to be that way. Ole Miss, you have your law school, your professional yeah. school, more yeah. so than your state. How do you feel about this 18-year-old thing, Roger? Right?
tell you, I find that these youngsters are more sympathetic, really, with what we're trying to do and understand what we're trying to do, frankly, better than some of our own members do. They're more sympathetic with our aims and objectives. This is the truth, you know. Well, uh, you don't just have to act on this thing, but uh, as your legislative representative uh, on items such as this, I need to know where we stand. I don't want to, you know, I can't go over there and lobby for something that, that we haven't acted on, and I'm not going to do that. If you don't want to take a position, it's all right. Well, Another thing in favor of 18 year olds. I think uh, a matter of economics is getting more important yeah. among this age group than ever before. Yeah. Uh, I'm told, of course, I haven't been in a position to really know, but I'm told that from your 18 to 21 year old college students are just as independent in interviews for employment economic matters as anything that you'll ever encounter. Yeah. I know a boy that's well up for Reynolds Tobacco Company. And he says that he has interviewed and interviewed and interviewed. And the kids that he interviews just nips him in the bud as far as employment is concerned. He's been with them for, well, I guess seven, eight years now district manager and above positions and he says he has the first one to hire yet out of a university or state school of higher learning and he's worked in Mississippi, Louisiana, Florida and is in Missouri now. And he said he had his first student to hire because they just don't talk about the kind of wages that Reynolds and back to come starts to they shoot and hire. They shoot and hire. And get right. them in the Yeah. Because yeah. they don't come back from the bottom. Yeah. And this is a pretty good indication that they are. Another thought along that line is simply this, too. At least they're not a part of this political machine that's been built up over the state. They can cast an independent of thinking on the bottom. Uh, uh, what I was thinking about now is we are talking of uh, college students. 18-year-olds, but we've got lots of 18-year-olds that are not college students. Well, of course, this is true. Uh, no question about this. I just use the college kids as yeah. an example. Now, I might say you find this in the high schools also. Uh, Tom and myself, uh, you know, speak quite often before high school groups also. And I, I don't want to leave the impression here that I'm just talking about college kids only. Uh, I find this to be the kids, period. I High fully, school or college. I fully believe that uh, 18 year olds that have had college or service time yeah. is qualified to vote by a bigger majority than us that's old. But uh, much of the percentage, will their percentage override these that didn't finish high school, these dropouts, and these others that'll be 18 year old will be able to vote and maybe won't have any more <coughs> consideration of all the voting than us older people do now. Well, don't you feel that, that the incentive uh, ratio among that group of dropouts you're talking about would probably run about the same as in the adult brackets? I do. 
If a man doesn't have incentive enough to finish school, he drops out on his own, you know. Uh, will he have incentive enough to become interested and go vote? You see, Not we got this matter of apathy in the adult population also. Huh? Not unless somebody gives you five dollars to vote for them. I suppose well, yeah. you need to get stopped. <laughs> <laughs> What's your feelings on this thing, Brother Clark? It's been kind of quiet over there. I don't know. I didn't listen to both sides. I thought I had my mind made up for y'all. <laughs> <laughs> quit, quit talking. You're just confusing. Yeah. <laughs> well, my worry about those, and that age is so easily led. Uh, I know when I was at, at that age, and I know other kids and all, uh, most of them, like you say, they're, they're better informed by far than we ever were. One that age, he's not mature enough, he's so easily led. And that's the only thing that worried me. As far as I'll agree with you that uh, it's the ability to have more information and all like that at hand is far better than it's ever been before. It's whoever's this doing is, the leading. Right, that's that's right. right. That's the point that worries me. Who's in control? Right. And you know, they can be led. You'll, you'll get you'll think back a little bit, though, and kind of study a little bit. You don't lead too damn much in the people that kids that age. They do their own thing. They even might think you're leading them, but they, you're the one being led. They appear to be more independent-minded today than they ever were, in my opinion. Uh, I keep bringing my son up there. This is his last election, his first time to vote. Yeah. The night before election, he sat down to me and said, Daddy, said, I need to talk to you about how we're going to vote tomorrow. And uh, I said, well, what you want to talk about? We just take a sample ballot. And uh, we went down it. Don't you do this with your wife also? Oh, yeah. I, I do. I vote just like she says. Just like you <laughs> Come on in, Bill. <laughs> don't you do it with your wife, Jack? Don't you all sit yes, down sir. and talk? Uh, Miss Phillips don't do this. They no, have too many fights in their house, so they just quit talking about it. <laughs> Please don't bring up all our problems about voting. <laughs> Well, do you fellas want to take a position on this, or you want to pass over it? I think we ought to take a position. I think it's our duty to, to take a position. Right. How? Now, I don't know. <laughs> but, I, but I feel like that's our responsibility and our place to take a position. Well, that's the reason I brought it to you. I thought we ought to myself. I may be the only one here feels that way about it. But I think when we don't take a position on anything, that, in other words, it don't make us any difference. Just either way that wants to roll. Mr. President, I offer you a motion. We uh, support the uh, move to break the old I'll second the motion. All right. Do you have any further discussion on the motion? Not all in favor signified by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carried and so order. Brother Pilot, we're glad to have you with us. This is a meeting of... Uh, of our board, a partial meeting. Apparently, the weather and a number of other things cut out on our attendance, but we're glad to have you sit in with us. You might want to comment from time to time. If you do, don't hesitate to ask for the floor. I think all of you know Bill Pilot from Hattiesburg, there, don't you? Another matter that we haven't uh, took a position on, it's been before the legislature before, as a matter of fact, was enacted and vetoed by the governor the last regular session is this open primary law that Stone Barefield has introduced again, which would eliminate the primary elections, have one open primary and a runoff between the two highest people. And this is not a thing in the world, but an attempt to eliminate a two-party system here in the state, what this is all about in the opinion of most people. Uh, I'd like to open the floor up for discussion on this matter. I personally don't think much of that idea. Well, I don't either. Never have. Uh, well, I think we should have a two-party system in the state. Get all them uh, Republicans out of the Democratic Party. <laughs> what we, you know, what we really need in this state is restoration by parties. Right. You'll have some confused people when you do that. They ain't going to know where to be. It's 
people on the fair, the Republicans, to be able right. to pick the man that they want their candidate yeah. to oppose. I would suggest if you take a position in opposition to the open primary that we take a position in favor of party registration. When you register by political parties, you, re you see, the Republicans then can't participate in the Democratic primaries. See, what's happened in Mississippi and it's happened in other states also is that the Republicans vote in the Democratic primaries, and quite often they are the determined factor in who wins that primary, and then they, what they do is vote for the guy that they think the Republicans can defeat the easiest, you see. It's happened in this state. Can we get a motion on this matter? This is our open primary, and if you would like the party restoration thing. Mr. President, I offer a motion. We oppose the open primary and support the party registration. Can we get a second to that second. motion? We got any more discussion on that matter? Not all in favor of the motion signify it to say an aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Uh, I've got now a number of items jotted down that we need to give consideration for resolutions on to be presented to the convention, and several of them are standard items that we uh, each year present to the convention to reaffirm our position, to call their, content, uh, their, their, their attention to existing situations and what have you. It'll be necessary for us to submit a couple of constitutional changes to bring the Constitution in line with the rules governing state central bodies. I have here a letter from President Meany in regards to our Constitution, remember we made some changes at the last one. We thought we had it in line, but if we overlooked one or two items, apparently, and I'll read this letter to you. This is to acknowledge receipt of the amendments to the Constitution of the Mississippi FLCIO adopted by the 1966 Convention. Because the Mississippi FLCIO holds its conventions biannually, Rule 10 requires that the average membership of affiliated local unions shall be based on 24 months rather than 12 in Article 3, Section 2. Also, the average membership of all local unions affiliated for less than 24 months is to be determined by dividing the per capita tax paid for all months affiliated by 24. If you recall, it's 12 uh, in, the, in, the, in the Constitution. And we've been figuring it on a on a the year basis prior to the convention. Instead of figuring it on a year, we will we're required to figure it for the two years between conventions. Is what it amounts to. It'd be simply a matter of changing that 12-month period to 24. <coughs> it will also be necessary to either eliminate the flat five dollars and ten dollar affiliation and reinstatement fees for local unions, or to establish per capita fees in Article 10 rule in Article 10. Rule 15 requires that all fees paid by local unions be on a per capita basis. With the above corrections and in accordance with Rule 8 of the rules of the FLCIO, Governor State Central Bodies, the amendments are hereby approved. Fraternally yours, George Meany. I have written to John <coughs> Smith requesting uh, copies of the rules. We apparently have got rid of all we had. We ordered some once, and we can't find one in our office. So maybe we might ask you fellas as long as yours. <laughs> but if it's agreeable with the board, Tom and I will draft a resolution in compliance with this letter uh, in behalf of the executive board. And I don't think it'll be too hard to do. 
but if you remember at our last convention we we uh, adopted an amendment uh, it said in effect that that the rules regulate central bodies would supersede or take place or anything where there was any conflict so actually that's this would apply here anyhow do we have any <coughs> discussion on this matter I'll make a motion if you do go ahead and do that so that brother Knight and myself uh, draft this resolution any discussion on that not all in favor of the motion signify to say aye aye all opposed what you're talking about because I've got two or three telephone calls from those candidates up there. Bob. I did too. Yeah. Tom, don't you think that we could uh, probably take care of this by amending this the code by law? I just think it'd be more appropriate to do it this way than in the state council yeah, constitution. I, 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 I figured it would yeah. go through the yeah. code uh, some way, but I didn't know yeah, where it should go. Yeah. That's the way it has to be. Tell you what, Brother Dees, uh, when we have our next full board meeting at prior to the convention, probably when we'll have it, and maybe we'll have uh, uh, everybody there, uh, we'll try to bring this matter up. In the meantime, Brother Knight and myself will see what we can do on a proposed change to the state code bylaws. And, uh, the same would apply, not only to the yeah. attorney and member of the house. It apply to anything. you got overlapping, yeah. you got two organizations. We'll have a board meeting uh, prior to the convention a day or two days prior to the convention. Yeah, uh, I know I, we got to have meeting yeah. today. Yeah, well, we'll, we usually have a board meeting on a Sunday prior to the convention. That's what we usually do, and I assume that's what we'll do this time, uh, uh, to take care of uh, matters and review all of these uh, resolutions and everything that we're going to be presenting. Uh, frankly, the, the main purpose of this meeting here is to uh, finish up the convention business and get the committee to set up the draft resolutions and the speakers and what have you. And of course, we wanted action on these uh, legislative matters since they're in the hopper. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run down through this uh, list of items here to see... Uh, that we have that we think that uh, we might think about drafting resolutions. Now, you might take note if there's an item we've overlooked to make sure you call our attention to it. Number one would be affiliations. Three, organizing. <coughs> uh, needed uh, changes in the National Labor Relations Act, COPE committees, political unity, Consumer legislation, mental health, union label and services, the Office of Economic Opportunity, Vietnam, and extremism and violence. There's some items that we, Tom and I, went over and thought it might be good subject matters for uh, convention action. Uh, there might be that some of them are here that you think we might not ought to fool with. If you do, well, let us know, and we'll strike them from the list. You might not want to, for instance, you might not want to have anything to say about Vietnam this time. <laughs> I don't know. What's the deal on affiliation before the Vote. That's 
to get one vote. Get full no, representation. You got to be in a whole year, year no, two, plus three two months. Years two, years. two years. Two well, years for this amendment. Well, well actually, what it amounts to that it's that whatever the per capita tax is paid for, you average it out by 24, and uh, it would depend. that's how the vote would be determined. But three three months before the convention, you just are. Do we do they get one? One hundred twenty days. You remember, we amended it before. That would be a new local union that would come in uh, after this period had passed. They would be entitled to one, one delegate, one but vote. Full, full membership, vote delegation, be two years. Full strength. That's where no, we've we been did. doing this last year. We just took from January to December and divided it by 12. But the way the new law is, you got to do it for two full years and divide it by 24. If you come in less that time, you still get all of that. And you just you divide it by 24, whatever it is. Yeah. You just well, average it out. What it amounts to. You average it out. I know we pay the same month, same amount each month, once a year. I try to send it to the U.S. mail and all that. Got to be from that January, December, that first. I might tell you on this affiliation thing that I'm meeting Tuesday night with a large group of government employees down on the coast uh, that uh, want to affiliate. This is something unusual. We've been contacted by the director of organizing for the American Federation of Government Employees. We want to know how they can get into the state AFL-CIO. Oh, we get their check for the <laughs> That's the Kiesler people and the other people. Well, got a couple of them I do, too. Well, well, he says he told me they're going to affiliate them all. So all about oh. what he tells me. Mm. Mm. and the rubber workers uh, and the amalgamated clothing workers do a real good job on trying to keep their locals affiliated. If we had a kind of cooperation out of everybody, we wouldn't have too many trouble. I had a little problem keeping ours in for a while and sending them to the captain for the port. We got to talk about how much money we sent down and start sending them with the month, they ain't missing. <laughs> <laughs> By the month, they hadn't missed it. How about that? All right, let's see now. Let's uh, see if we can get some assignments here. Uh, we got any volunteers on drafting resolutions? Brother, what you can do, I tell you what now, what the thing to do is to those of you, when you get ready to draft them on some of these standard resolutions, is just get the convention proceedings of the last convention, and uh, you can get some ideas from there. We don't want the same resolution, but it'll give you the idea. Now, Brother Knight and myself, if you want us to, can draft the one on affiliation. And we can get Bob Starnes to help us draft one on organizing. And the needed changes in the National Labor Relations Act. Now, we'd like to get a committee or some individual to agree to the political unity resolution, which would include Koch committees, what have you, similar to the one adopted last time. Brother Clark, I wondered if you and uh, 
and uh, Beth and Mr. Brown uh, would uh, take over that responsibility and draft us a resolution on on that item. Get your copy of the of the you got a copy of the convention proceedings. Uh, this uh, there's one in there adopted last time that would. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, what we can do here, see, is that uh, on the affiliation organizing and the changes in the act, we can uh, we can uh, ask Brother Schaefer and Brother Woodson and Brother Dunlap uh, to serve as a subcommittee with Brother Knight and myself on these items here. What we'll try to do is make it convenient where you don't have to. Uh, you know, somebody in a particular area where it won't be so hard for you to get together. Uh, is that agreeable to do that? Uh, we'll appoint yeah. Brother Dunlap, Brother Woodson, Brother Schaefer, and Brother Knight, myself, responsible for the the affiliation organizing changes in the act. Will this be a, in will another a committee of delegates signed to that? What'd you say? Well, now, what this will be is resolution presented in the name of the executive <coughs> board. Now, I don't mean that it's limited. Uh, if you've got a CLU wants to send in a resolution on something, well, you send it in. But this will be resolution submitted in the name of the executive board, as we have in the past, you see. And we're just going to set up some subcommittees to draft these resolutions. All right, Brother Clark and, and uh, Beth Harbor and Vice President Brown will act, will act as a subcommittee on political unity, and I've already named the ones on the other three. Now, I guess we ought to, and that one that we're going to consider here, should add mental health to that. Political unity. Cope and political unity, yeah. Uh, the Jackson, the subcommittee here in Jackson, I want to suggest that we draft the one on mental health. So I've got Mattel in the office, uh, and we'll try to come up with something on that. Now, <coughs> consumer legislation. I guess we'd better handle that one also, huh? We'll have to have some data on that, and uh, since we've got the material, I guess we'd better take that one also. Don't uh, now, union label and services, we, uh, let's well, see, huh? What? Brother Deves, how about you, uh, huh? But you, uh, you get on to Tupelo, don't you, every now and then? Could we uh, ask you and Brother Edwards to get together on that resolution? Which one was that? Union Label and Union Services. That was a good resolution we uh, had before, and I think Marvin Taylor might have. Uh, uh, Marvin and James. Huh? Marvin, Marvin and James before. Is that right? <laughs> that's, that's no more than going in and asking for a union label in your suit of clothes. Right? Right. What do you do? You just pick up? I, when, I, when I call for long distance operator, answer. So, you know, most of the time, I believe, if I remember right, she said, can I offer her, can I help you? I'll ask her, is she a union operator? And she would say, what do you mean? I said, do you belong <laughs> to CWA? Do you belong to organized <laughs> labor? And some of them, one of them says, you bet your boots I do. And I'd go ahead and place my call. And I had two or three that says, I ain't supposed to answer that. I said, well, give me one that will. 
<laughs> and she said, I hooked you up with a supervisor. And she was hooked up with a supervisor. And I said, I want a union operator. <laughs> and she would say, just a minute. And then and they'd give me one. You've to be all day long, getting that long distance. <laughs> <laughs> well, in other words, they'll learn it in just a day or two. <laughs> one of them called me back one time and told me, said, Mr. D says, this operator you had just before now, said, she lied to you and said, she's not. But she said, she's up here apologizing to everyone who's in here now because she's done it. <laughs> she won't do it more. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? I was in and I asked the operator there out of a hotel one time. I was working got the operator. She just said, we're not allowed to answer that. I said, well, they are at home. I'll just wait till I get back home and place my call. And she said, well, what did you want to know? She said, yeah. I said, we all belong. I said, well, good. And I want to hit place my call. <laughs> now, you'll have to tell Bill Stanton about the organizing work you're doing for him up there. <laughs> I still say one of the best labels that we've come up with yet is label for our checks. Yeah, sir. Is made I wonder where you can find them at anymore. I'd love to buy some. Well, we can get them right here. We ordered we had them somewhere. Where did we get them? them? We ordered them. Years ago. Uh, who did we have print? CNS, wasn't it? I think. CNS Printing Company. Maybe we ought to have some more printed up. Huh? We ought to get them printed for the convention at least. Make a note of that on your I'd pad. Have we'll see if we can get some. We'll, we'll put them in the kits. We still have some. Well, I let you know something else. That local Laird Carnes, I could get them just overnight. <laughs> <laughs> but they done been to me wanting to get an IB there. Uh, let me get you back on the track here. Yeah, I'm going to add Brother Taylor to that subcommittee on that union label and services. You might confer with him by phone. You don't have to just get together. Now, uh, how about, uh, do you want a resolution drafted on uh, the Office of Economic Opportunity? We dropped, adopted one at the last convention. And the right of all this local... Huh? Uh, well, we got, yes, we got a problem. Darn right, that newspaper clipping I passed out to you indicates the problem we got. This is uh, new organization of Coopers and, uh, and uh, your fellow Baxter, Baxter Wilson and several more. You talk about a power grab, this is one of them. You ought to read the chart of incorporation of this thing, fellas. I finally got a copy of it the other day. And uh, that thing is set up in such a fashion that they plan on taking over the state of Mississippi. Anything short of murder. Yeah. I think a resolution uh, uh, spelling this out and everything else out uh, should be. You need something down there. <coughs> and the policy making bodies? Right. I guess we'd better handle that one too. Right now, the old report we had to get out there in December was kind of rough on me. It's the old report they required for us to get out at the end of December. Yeah, I didn't get it out either. It's finished. We're going to do a lot of resolution writing. Ain't no lie. I worked on Sunday. Well, how about the Vietnam thing? You want a resolution on Vietnam or let the one we adopted last time suffice? Huh? No change in the situation, really. We got enough to do anyhow. I'm going to scratch that one off the list. She said, <laughs> how about the extremism thing? You want the one we adopted last to suffice or do you think we ought to adopt a new one? That agree with everybody. We'll let Robbie. If there's anybody you want to consult with, you go ahead. You and Smitty might want to get together down there and work that one over. Y'all been involved with that thing pretty good down there. 
Now, that's the items that... Huh? You still are. Yeah, I'm sure of that. Once you get involved with them, you, it's a continual affair. It never ends. Uh, that's the items I have here. Do you have a to get these in? Yes, we'd like to request that you get these things in at least a month ahead of the convention in order to give us the time to prepare them. Now, the constitutional changes... First of March now, when you want them in. Yeah, we can get them in by the first of March. Or we ought to be able to get them ready. Now, the constitutional changes will have to be prepared and mailed out to the local unions. I believe it's 45 days before the convention, isn't it? It's a long way. No less than 45 days, so we'll have to prepare these and get these in the mail right away as soon as possible. But the resolutions that do not involve uh, constitutional changes, uh, the only requirement there is that they be sent into the office in time to prepare them. Now, this doesn't prohibit anybody from introducing a resolution at the convention, you see, but uh, for consideration. But uh, it does help us if you'll get them in in time to prepare them or have them in the kits. That's, that's what we need. Is it just the resolution? No, it's just the resolution. Just the resolution. Now, do any of you have any items you want uh, resolutions considered on? No, I'd board? like some thinking on these uh, proposed changes of the National Labor Relations Board or the abolition of the yeah. National Labor Relations Board and the establishment of the Labor Court. Uh, I have pretty mixed emotions on On the court thing? <laughs> on the board. <laughs> yeah. And I know nothing of uh, the court. Well, I think what we what we need to do, uh, we got the subcommittee of, uh, of, uh, of the board members in the Jackson area. That's Brother Dunlap, Brother Woodson, yourself, Tom, and myself. Uh, and we'll ask Bob to sit down. What we need to do, I think, is to have a meeting sometime in the near future. Uh, and go over the proposed changes we have in mind. I have some real strong reservations about this court idea. Dixon Piles has been promoting it, but I've read a number of analyses on this thing by lawyers in the labor movement in several of the publications uh, pointing out the fa fallacy of this thing. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I wouldn't suggest that at all that we come up with a resolution endorsing this uh, labor court item. You know, well, this one's uh, full of bugs. On first thought and some experience with the board, yeah, uh, it's pretty catchy. It sure is. Now you see, the reason I suggested Bob is that Bob attended the subcommittee hearings in Washington. And uh, carried uh, Ray Smith Hart and several other people up that also testified before that uh, House subcommittee that was considered uh, considering these changes. <coughs> That's the reason I suggested we have Bob sit in and help us draft this resolution so we come out with something uh, more intelligent than we might otherwise do. Well, yes. On this uh, Constitution. Yeah. The board, vice president, things like that. Uh, yeah. Does that thing actually read the expense of loss, or you got one particular case I'm thinking about? Yeah. Wages lost, or yeah. something like that. Uh, you got a copy of the Constitution in your own. Oh, let me see if I got one. No, I can check this out. Uh, Constitution is not clear on this. It's always been my understanding that. Uh, it, it is actually on wages lost. You know, that's fine. See? But, but if a, if a on, uh, on, ex on travel expenses, uh, it says that they'll pay you 10 cents a mile. Now, we have always operated under the assumption that we, we paid, if you drove your automobile, you got 10 cents a mile. But if you travel by a bus, you got reimbursed for your bus fare. If you went by airplane, you was reimbursed actually the actual fare. All right, suppose you uh, yeah. retired. Huh? Suppose you retired. On wages? Yeah, you ain't entitled. You ain't 
Well, you're not entitled. You're not entitled to reimbursement on anything but wages actually lost. And the Constitution clear on this. I think we better check a lot of these things. Well, um, this is something that you don't have to amend the Constitution on. The Constitution is clear uh, in all areas except travel. You know. And when we, when we uh, start reimbursing board members for travel and expenses, we, they're on their honor when it comes to turning in actual wages lost, you know. Now, if, and uh, frankly, I, uh, the board, I think uh, we, we need uh, board action on this thing, that uh, when it comes to reimburse for travel, that we reimburse for actual cost of travel, you know. If it's bus, bus fare. If it's airplane, airplane fare. And if you drive your automobile, 10 cents a mile is provided by the Constitution. I, we, we're talking about Vice President Brown now, who uh, come up with the idea that he's supposed to be given 10 cents a mile for travel, even though he rode the bus. Who also gets paid for a day's work and he's retired. Yes, and then uh, he turned in for lost wages, but this last committee meeting, he didn't do that. Apparently, you must have talked to him. See, I didn't know, we didn't know over here, Brother Clark, we didn't know here in the office that Brown wasn't really working. When he turns in lost wages, we figured that he had actually lost that amount of wages. But he gets charged for someone sitting with his wife this last time. He getting charged for $8. Broad, I think that ought to be worked out just on the board yeah, members, right. just like the last board meeting you had. I had to be in Chattanooga. I could have got through the meeting there in time to have caught a plane and flew down here and uh, went and caught a ride from here back home. But yeah. rather than put that expense on there, I didn't feel like it was that important that I be at that meeting. I felt yeah. like the meeting was going without me without a charge of that much to the office only. You know, I yeah. talked with you or Paul one on it. I forget which one I talked to him. Yeah. Boy. Right. I, in other words, I think we all want to consider. Uh, <coughs> I'd like to get a motion and get it in the record here that that the state council will pay the actual travel expenses of board members incurred by travel other than automobile. That's clear. Would you offer that motion? We have any further discussion on that matter. Not all in favor of the motion signified to say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. You kind of want to spot on something like this when you in Tom's position in mind because, as I said, uh, everybody's on the honor in this organization. The Constitution spells out that wages actually lost and uh, it's clear on 10 cents a mile if you drive your automobile. It's clear on travel expenses with me and him when we go out of the state, you see. But it's silent on this matter that we're talking about as far as board members are concerned. All right, we have any other items that the uh, board members want to present for consideration uh, to be presented by the board. Now, let me explain this to you. We're just talking about items now, resolutions to be sponsored by the board. Again, a local union or any other affiliated organization can send in resolutions on any matter they won't consider by the convention. Mr. Constitution, it's got to be how many days? Forty-five days. Constitutional amendments. Constitutional amendments, 45 days. That's just about it. About 15 days. It's going to be in 60 days and out 45 days. Carl, I'd like to ask you both. an increase in per capita tax? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I hadn't heard 
I hadn't heard the financial report from the state office. We have a, we have a four day convention, it's going to be in bad shape. <laughs> but I'll tell you this. I think we, not that I'm doing anything about it, I think I've even got the carpenters in, but we need to get more affiliations in, and by raising the per capita tax, we're not going to get any more. We'll stand a chance of losing something, I think, that's just my personal feeling. I grant you, we need more money, we need to pay it in. Maybe that should come from your local union there, instead of from the board, Robert. Uh, it wouldn't hurt to have one submitted uh, in the name of local union, whether it's passed or not. Uh, point out. <coughs> you want to get a new board next time, you can let them present it. <laughs> <laughs> well, my thinking right now as a board member, I'd have to vote against it on the board. May be thinking wrong. Somebody may talk to him, and I may be like Clark, have, have a mind made up now, but it might change. <laughs> well, I don't know of anything, any major changes as far as policy or expenditure since the yeah. proposed reduction or yeah. recommended recommendation from the board that we reduce yeah. The situation, uh, for your information, has uh, slightly improved over what it was two years ago in terms of affiliation and in terms of the finances of the council we have uh, picked up uh, affiliation has improved some this whole thing uh, our financial situation <coughs> really is dependent upon a continuation of the subsidy we're receiving from washington now uh, from two sources if they will continue to uh, uh, subsidize us then we can continue making certain improvements for instance, this retirement thing we're talking about this, that was in the, that the exec committee just considered is really dependent upon the uh, continuation of the subsidy. We can't consider that without an assurance of uh, continuation of subsidy. Uh, and it might uh, be that the affiliation thing uh, uh, would improve better by not increasing the capital. I don't know. But I, I know what Robert has in mind. And, uh, well, I think yeah. we can all agree. Yeah. I got one in mind, but I still don't know how to work it. I'm going What's that? <laughs> huh? Dividing it up, it worked out all right, but they yeah. go, uh, uh, guarantee it's going to stay like that. They yeah. That is a good approach, there's no question about it, and of course uh, uh, we made an effort to try to do just that, uh, and uh, trying to work out a board that would be interested in really getting the job done, and I think, you know, with the programs that we've got, uh, the success of them depends a large degree upon the cooperation between the state office and the central body. In order to be effective, you need representation from the central body on your board. There's no question about that. We, uh, we got in a kind of situation over there with Cub Brown, of course. I'm not saying that against him, but he, he is retired and he don't uh, have the initiative and don't have the help to get out and to do the work to see the young man get done. But at that time, uh, he was the only man we could take on account of the limitations on it. Well, this is, this is part of the problem. Yeah, so we, had, we had a problem there. This was better than nothing what it was. Well, if you can get the woodworkers affiliated, if you could get the woodworkers affiliated to, over there. Well, that's what I was asking about a while ago. I'm going to get them to go. They're coming. Well, I think so. I think that the president of the, this new president of the Woodworkers Union uh, is probably going to uh, get in and help us out on this. I got a nice letter from him not long ago explaining the law situation. And uh, I wrote him back a rather lengthy letter uh, pointing out the lack of cooperation from the woodworkers. And I believe that this thing's going to change. And, of course, Eubanks told me 
that they had increased the, the union dues and would <laughs> be in a better position financially before long and that they were going to try to affiliate. Well, they don't be the ones that have to break the ice. Okay? Yeah. That would be the answer to it. Get wood on and affiliated, and then you could have somebody you could probably choose out of that group. Does what now? Does any local union have to be affiliated with this uh, local labor council to have delegates in the election of those members? I don't believe so, do we, Tom? Not that, not in, just so they're affiliated with the state one. I think there ought to be a requirement in there also that they be affiliated with your local bodies in order to be accounted a delegate to vote in the state level election. I, I believe this matter is covered by the rules governing uh, local and state central bodies. Uh, we'll, we'll have to check this one out. We'll get the rules on it. I'm not sure you can, according to those if, rules. If it could be done, yeah. I think it would have a bearing on getting more affiliation from your... Uh, now, this is one thing that uh, that is a constitutional prohibition, and that's... Uh, a delegate from a central labor union uh, who is a member of a local not affiliated with a state council cannot be seated as a delegate. This is clear here. A guest, but he can't be seated as a voting delegate. I know I was thinking on working that on the telephone workers there at home. We were elected, yeah, and our secretary and treasurer. Yeah, well, if it's this, if their local is not affiliated, I'm gonna try to get him to come to the convention as a guest, as a guest, right? So that uh, I believe he makes one convention, he goes back home. I believe he'll affiliate the local union. Well, I know this thing set up on this invitation. Why don't you take, get your central body to draft a resolution along the lines that you're talking about and send it in from the Central Labor Council? If, if, see, you got one vice president, though you have. Yeah. You have two board members. Yeah. Might have right. That would be two. I uh, wasn't in on drafting. I wasn't in on drafting of the original <coughs> Constitution, and I, I don't know the thinking that went into that thing. Maybe you might have been, Jack. Were you in on the original? I'm not Doctor? sure why there was or not. It seems that it was. Yeah, back, that's been several years back. This yeah. board, Tom and I, uh, was elected to the offices we hold. But I assume the reason that that prohibition was put in there was for that reason, that one particular international union wouldn't wind up with all of the officers, you see. Well, you wouldn't go away. you take the Yeah.
they've never been in, so it's like you said, too. Well, Margaret Hicks used to be on the board, you know. Well, this poses a real problem. There's no question about it, see, to try to do what we are trying to do, and that's to get... The ideal situation would be for the presence of your central body to be board members here, really, would be the ideal situation. And we've got a lot of CLU presence, such as you and Brother D's here, and Robbie, who are presidents of central bodies, you see. But because of what you're talking about, you can't work it out all the time because you wind up with more people out of one particular international union than the Constitution will allow. Why don't you work to uh, take this up with your board and send a resolution in from the CLU on it? Mm -hmm. I think with the cost of living, yeah. we didn't have two vice presidents. We need to be more than two yeah. vice presidents. Have they got that lunch ready to go over there? Uh, they will be. Uh, we got several central body president, Brother Johnson there, and Brother Ponders, and Brother Pilot, he all sitting with us. Uh, we've invited the Central Labor Council to send delegates up here today and have lunch with us. We want to talk, Tom will be reviewing with you the program for this afternoon and, and, the, and the spring workshops uh, after we have lunch over here. We're glad to have all of you with us. Uh, I would suggest, uh, would urge the, those of you not on the board and those of you on the board uh, that you, when you go back, uh, give some thought to sending some resolutions in from your central body. If you've got a matter that needs, that you think needs to be considered, a problem that you are having, uh, draft a resolution and you're sponsored by the central body. This is a good place to originate these things at the central body level. I'm sure you've got some matters that you need some help and consideration on. Now, if we don't have anything else, if you don't have anything else to come up here, yeah. All right. Uh, Southern Labor School, most of you, I'm sure all of you, many of the Southern Labor School that operates the basic institute each year and also the advanced institute, um, they try something. they call a young trade, a school for young trade unions. Now, they, I think they've got to decide in Texas, AFL-CIO, well, they uh, for several years have sponsored a number of these clinics around in the various colleges and universities in Texas and had tremendous success. They invite the local unions to uh, pick out a member 30 years of age or younger, somebody who perhaps holds an office or at least some member that's interested that attends local union meetings shown an interest, and uh, they have a week-long institute, and of course the, the agenda varies, includes <coughs> the, the uh, average subjects that you find on uh, a labor school, and the Southern Labor School uh, this past fall decided to venture into this, and uh, they're going to have one of these in Atlanta, February the 11th through the 16th, at the Albert Pig Hotel. Mississippi is entitled to five delegates. I've contacted a number of the larger local units, and we're still going to be short if we don't uh, have some success. And I was wondering if some of you, perhaps in your local, or you might know of some local that might be interested in this. Now, it's, we've got locals that are interested, but they don't have anybody they feel like it'd be worth wasting that much money on in that age bracket. This is the situation, but I think we'll all agree that the young people need cultivate. If we have those that are interested in the local, the labor movement, they should be given an opportunity. And uh, the the cost of this thing is a hundred dollars. That's everything, of course, uh, except your lost time and travel to Atlanta. If you if you feel like your local might uh, be willing to to uh, uh, look into this matter, I've got a credential. And um, Was that February, uh, the February the February through the sixteenth. And um, I'm supposed
post go over there, I guess, uh, next Friday to meet with Guernsey and some of the other people from the other states to talk about this thing. Uh, I'd be willing to uh, uh, give you a credential and a memorandum that I have that kind of explains the school a little bit. I don't have with me, but I'll get them during the noon hour. Uh, if you have somebody in this age limit that you think might be interested I talked to Al about it. He said it well. He, of course, he don't uh, he don't uh, encourage it because of what Tom says. But I, I pointed out to him that it was so convenient, you see. I think well, the, the, the question is this. Yeah. In other words, we're sending our local sending four delegates there where they wouldn't or wouldn't be able to send over one. Anymore. Right, right. Well, at least you'll, uh, you'll be there to hear the, uh, the uh, fellow says, the lay of the land. and we might avoid some of this legislation, but it, it's, you really get shook up uh, when this thing's laid out there right before you, before your very eyes. So, well, the first thing our people looked at, of course, is the expense, like y'all yeah. that looked at around the state office. Yeah. The distance, and then there's right on the brochure there, a sale right. in New Orleans is $17 <laughs> to $18 a day, and, uh, and be Memphis is nine, <laughs> That's the first thing they looked at and said, we're in less than 100 miles or about 100 miles of Memphis. Yeah. Miami Beach and the LLC convention, the hotels was listed. Of course, the one I picked, uh, or one, uh, not the one I picked necessarily, but the only place I get reservations started $12. Well, it was just out of them when I got there. 22 was as cheap as they had. <laughs> that or sleep in the street, you see. Or just so it wasn't a holiday in. There you go, but we would appreciate, uh, we probably got some other people in North Mississippi that's going to go to Memphis if they go at all. But we would appreciate your participation as, as best you can. I just figured it's better to get several up there and what, maybe just get one out of that area down there. Yeah. Well, now listen, we can adjourn the board meeting if you want to and continue uh, in a bull session. Get ready for lunch over the other side of the room there. You might want a few minutes before we, before lunch maybe, before the rest of them, whatever. Would you like to do that? We have a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn is in order. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, so ordered. Brother Knight will talk about the meeting this afternoon after the lunch. Paper, can we come back? Huh? Do we need any of these when we come No. Back. Thank <laughs> you.
You want a handful of these to take with you? I've got some. No, it was a bad one. That's right. She was, she was the same place I was that weekend. I brought that for you. That's all the one I do. We was in about eight inches of snow up next that weekend. We'd have rather been here. Yeah. We drove in that eight inches all the way back. You come to train? Coming back that Sunday night, I run out of it. Just uh, down about West Point. I cut across, I couldn't come through before Bob that Bob Bigby was out that same weekend. Sure enough, yeah. I just came down. Watch it. Oh, that's right. Well, we're short. Woodson, Morgan, and Mall. Mall, Clayton Mall. Are you restarting that? Father, we thank thee for the blessings of this day. We thank thee for the privilege of assembling together this beautiful Lord's Day. And we can come together for, to prepare for the upcoming session of the Mississippi AFL-CIO. We pray thy blessings upon each person here and each group of people that they represent. We pray that this would be a fruitful and a beneficial occasion and that the proper groundwork would be laid for the convention that would enable us to go back to our respective communities and do the jobs that we are capable of doing. We pray thy blessing upon the labor movement in the state and in the nation. Guide us and direct us in all of our deliberations and forgive us in the fields of failure. Help us resolve to do better, be better citizens, better Christians, and be rep better representatives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let me say we appreciate <coughs> the fact that all of you are present here this afternoon, and we will determine at this time that we do have a quorum present. The last meeting we called the board, and we made that determination and decided after the meeting was over, we got to do in the minutes that we didn't have a quorum. I overlooked the fact that we had went from a 15-man board to a 17-man board, and we only had eight people present at that meeting. So, as all of you know, in the correspondence we sent out, we, uh, we advised at that time that business transaction transacted would not be considered legal because we didn't have a quorum present. Um, we will have a rather busy afternoon this afternoon. We have quite a bit of business to take care of. And I'd ask the cooperation of everyone present to help move the meeting along as rapidly as possible. Um, doesn't mean that we shouldn't give everything we ought to consider proper consideration. <coughs> we have, uh, the secretary here has made available to you the convention kit. In those kits you'll find the resolutions that, uh, that will be submitted uh, by the executive board and one or two others that's been submitted by other organizations. Now, our major problem here this afternoon is going to center around consideration of the resolutions. Now, you've received uh, three proposed constitutional changes, resolutions number one and two, submitted by the executive board, which are, in effect, mandatory uh, changes in the Constitution. Then we have resolution number three, which is submitted by the Meridian Central Labor Council, which is also a constitutional change. How would you uh, prefer to deal with the resolution here this afternoon? Would you like to read each one of them? Uh, 
would you like to have a little time and read them individually by yourself? Or how would you propose to do that? Well, it will take a little time, but they should be read. You want to read the, the uh, two constitutional changes that you've already received? You want to read those also? That's one and two. Now, you don't have to act on three. Three has been submitted by Marie. That'll be placed in the Constitution Committee. Judge Clark, I think if we uh, just went to the resolve and uh, read the resolve and uh, and then we might save some time. Then if anyone has any questions about the other, uh, whereas is why well, we'll this would save some time, I think, to read this to us. I think probably the first thing we need to do now that Brother Knight is here is to read the minutes of the January 14th meeting, uh, which a number of items uh, were discussed and acted upon, and let the board here this afternoon decide what part
This was discussed at great length with the board adopting a motion to support legislation lowering the voting age from 21 to 18. Open primary law. President Ramsey explained this proposal was designed to eliminate the two-party system in Mississippi and that what was actually needed was registration by political parties to keep Republicans from voting in the Democratic primary. It was moved second and carried that we oppose the open primary but support legislation but support registration by political parties. Convention resolutions to be submitted in the name of the executive board was the next item of business. President Ramsey read a letter he had received from George Meaning relating to bringing our Constitution in line with the rules governing state central body. It was agreed that he and Secretary Knight would draft a resolution on needed constitutional change. Following committees and resolutions were assigned, affiliation, organizing, Needed changes in NLRB Act, consumer legislation, mental health, OEO, Claude Ramsey, Thomas Knight, C.E. Schaefer, C.A. Dunlap, Robert Woodson, Political Unity Co., E.J. Brown, L.D. Clark, Beth Harper, Union Label and Services, E.B. Edwards, Marvin Taylor, and S.H.D., Extremism, H.H. H. Robert. President Ramsey requested that resolution be sent in as soon as possible and not later than 30 days prior to the convention date so they could be prepared in time for the convention. He stated, however, that the constitutional change would have to be mailed to the locals 45 days prior to the convention so they would have time to take action on them. The matter of board members, expenses, and lost salary was discussed. It was moved, seconded, and carried that the state council only pay actual transportation costs when vehicle other than personal automobile is used. The matter of an increase in per capita tax was presented by Brother Woodson for consideration. Brother Dee stated that he felt we would lose affiliation for this even from this, even though <coughs> the money was needed. The President Ram suggested a resolution on this matter should come from the local union rather than the board. <coughs> Brother Clark asked about presenting a constitutional change to allow for a board member from each central labor union district and President Ramsey suggested this resolution should come from the CLU. Secretary and I discussed the Southeastern School for Young Trade Unionists, sponsored by the Southern Labor School, and scheduled for February 11th to 16th in Atlanta. He also urged participation in the 1968 Area Coke Conference in New Orleans, February 3rd. There being no further business to be considered, the board adjourned at 12:10 p.m. Of course, additional paragraph there stating that we had some central body presidents and the president in addition to the board. You heard the reading of those minutes in order that they might, any action taken there be official, it's appropriate that this meeting act on them. Do we have any discussion, any suggestions on the matter? Perhaps, sir. I would like to make this comment.
probably would not be able to run the same thing and fly it to Bomberito with the rubber workers. And one of several others that I invited, of course, I talked with Al Barkin himself personally, and, and he advised me that he had such a tight schedule that he just wouldn't be able to get on for this particular convention, but he didn't want to wish him some kind of success in the world. Would you like to take a minute or two and look at the agenda over before proceeding? Chairman, do you still you want, want a motion on yes, the minutes? Yes, we'd like to. We'd like, I think it'd be appropriate. To I'll, I move that the minutes be stand, uh, stand as read. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of the meeting of January the 14th. Do we have any further discussion? Not all in favor of the motion signify to say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carried. So ordered. Would you like to take a minute or two to look at the agenda over before proceed? Can. 
you got two or three, five minutes in there for uh, what were you going to do? You know, last time we discussed a few of the uh, best labor county representatives or something like that. Senator, or something well, like that. we got Burl Palmer on the program. Now, this is what I thought we had tried to do, Brother Clark. Uh, we put out this agenda to give people a pretty good idea about what the program is, program is and when uh, various people will be on. And if it works out as it usually does, we ought to be able to squeeze a few in there. We didn't schedule them, but we thought uh, when some of them come in, like maybe Senator White or somebody you'd like to give a few minutes to, that we'd try to do it at that time, you see. That's, uh, that's the only way I can see to handle that. Now, Sergeant at Arms, we uh, recommended Ray Bryant, Rodney Pierce, E.L. Barnes, and Joe Mullins. Restoration and credentials, James Jackson, Chairman, Betty Williams, Ms. Floyd Berry, Ms. Ursula Culliford, Mrs. Merle Davis, Ms. Beth Harper, and Mrs. Earlene Pickett. And I understand you will start resting at what time? Six going to have a restoration period beginning at 6 this afternoon. We need the committee there about 5.15, 5, 5.30. You are, most of you have already served in this capacity. You've already proven that you do a good job, so you inherited this one again. On the audit committee, we've got J.K. Culler for chairman, Jones R. Fitzhugh, and T.P. McNeil. That committee has already done it. On the Rules Committee, C. E. Schaefer, Chairman, Clifton Dunlap, Byron Greer, J. R. Sauceman, Pauline Fortenberry, May Hodge, G. A. Canfield, and Edward Henry. I might as well give you the chairman as present here copies of this, so I won't have to go. Or would you rather do that tomorrow? You might I'd take them home and forget them, huh? Right? No, that's all right. I wouldn't well, can't can't take it. Put it in the kit, pass it by the guy. Constitution and Bylaws, Marvin Taylor, Chairman, R.E. Thompson, you thought you was off of it, V.C. Smith, Clayton Moss, T.L. Neekes, Lois Hampton, Beatrice Boyd, Charles E. Thomas, and Wayman Goodman. We thought you'd been having it too light. <laughs> <laughs> we you and Jack around. He's uh, been getting all the work and, and you all the play, so we want to get That's his own committee he's trying to pass off. I recall he's got two big bets on that. George uh, uh, offers his report. George Johnson, Chairman, Dan Butler, W.H. Wood, Maud Graham, Joe Franks, and Mike H. Hudson. Union, union Labor and Label, <coughs> E.J. Brown, Chairman, Elias Harden, W.W. Steele, Sue Reese, Mary Ward, Lon Gilstrap, Gavin Shoemake, and B.D. Stegall. Now, I've got Morgan on there. Is uh, he not going to be here, Morgan? No. Huh? No, he won't be. He won't be here at all, so I'll scratch Morgan on mm -hmm. He has two uh, delegates. Yeah. Well, I've tried to put all members <coughs> of the board on committees. Yeah. Uh, let's see, that's Brown. Be a pass it down him. Brown. And then you'll notice that most of the chairmen are going to be board members of vice president, something like that. But we try to spread the board around where we can have her. If anything comes up, you'll be in a position to furnish them with information. Mm -hmm. Social insurance. H.H. H. Robbins, uh, chairman. Raymond Tucker. Marvin Lindsay. L.J. Brown. Maggie Shepard, Virginia Dowdy, Emma Pearl Carter, Arthur Darden, and Billy Reeves. Education Committee. Clark Massey, Chairman, Obi Stringer, J.E. Peter, Peterman, Martha Flippo, Mildred Wynn, H.M. Curry, James Glenn, and Bobby J. Wren. <coughs> Right there, H.M. Curry won't be here. Uh, he's been involved in an automobile accident and he's in the hospital. Uh, now, uh, there's one uh, that is coming, though, that is taking his place that you might. Uh, All right, give us his uh, R.T. Doty. R.T., you not got him there somewhere? Is that one in my call, right? No, uh, R.T. R.T. Doty. D.O.T.Y. D.O.T.Y. Uh -huh. That's an H.M. Curry. That's an H.M. Curry.
Brother Stein just called my attention to another matter that I should have brought to your attention already. Bill Kirchner, the director of the Department of Organization, is going to be here tomorrow on the program. As a matter of fact, I keep old speaker. And uh, we are arranging a lunch for him with members of the organizing staff, the international representatives and organizers that have been participating in the organizing program. We thought it would be advisable to invite the CLU presence or any such body officers who would like to attend as interested in organizing. And we wanted to find out how you felt about uh, the board probably attending it. It'll be a Dutch lunch affair, each person paying, what is it, $3 a month? Uh, if the board wanted to go after the board, we could arrange to pick up the tab, uh, which would take care of those in-town board members, uh, you know what I'm talking about. But we'd like to get some discussion on it, find out if the board itself would like to attend this luncheon uh, in his honor, you might say. Yeah, it'll save me three bucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, me too. I had planned to go either way, but I'm in favor of anything you want to do on <laughs> Well, uh, let's see. Let's see the hands of the board members that uh, would be able and would like to attend. Hold up your hand. Bill's going to speak at the luncheon. Oh, Bill will talk at the luncheon. Is it unanimous? I believe it is. Well, why don't we? Why don't we get a motion here then that the that the state council. Uh, provide tickets to this luncheon for the board, the executive board members. And of course, it'll be understood that those of you on for them will uh, deduct it from it when you turn in your boxes. <laughs> 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 Saving you nothing. We, might, we, might. <laughs> we, we, we have a motion on that? I'll just a motion. I'll motion I'll second it. All right. Any further discussion? As a matter of explanation, yeah. Uh, we, tomorrow is the day for our regular monthly meeting of yeah. the organizing right. committee. Right. Now, we have no way in the world of knowing how many people will attend the luncheon tomorrow because right. many will be here whose names we don't have on our mailing list. Right. Plus the CLU presence and plus the board. Yeah. So just as information for the board, yeah. Todd's going to announce as early as he can tomorrow mm -hmm. the fact that there will be a luncheon. Those international reps and uh, directors and vice presidents, etc., who are here, mm -hmm. go back out to the registration desk right then, and we'll have Joe Mullins and Willie Hines and maybe some others to help us to register those people and collect the money and give them a ticket. So when you hear that announcement, you'll know what's going on. Well, I think we could probably arrange. Have you got tickets now, Bob? I don't have them with me. You don't have with you. If you could arrange to get them, we can make them available here. You could go ahead. It would be necessary for them to register when we make an announcement. You, you, I can get a list of the board. From the reason I'm reluctant about it, I went to the office yesterday and got all the stuff I wanted out of the office and put it in the briefcase and carried it home. Mm -hmm. So that's where it is. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I see. All right. Uh, well, and that's so I wouldn't have to come to the office in the morning. Well, we can uh, we can make a list. Uh, it'd be understood. What I'm trying to avoid is them having to go out and register. Yeah. Uh, Why don't we just pass a sheet of paper down the head and let everybody that's going put the name on? Well, this board's apparently not the problem. It's the other people no. in the convention no. that don't yeah. know about it. Well, the thing, thing about it is that it'd be understood when we make the announcement, it won't be necessary for the board to go out and register. That's we'll right. take care of that's it. Right. So when that announcement's made, you just ignore it, and we'll. We'll assume, let's see, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, what I got five, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. You go be sixteen. Okay, fifteen board members, and maybe she, where she can, she will attend. Fifteen for sure. Yeah, because we've got to tell this hotel something so they can get right. food ready. Right. Okay, at least you know you're going to have 15 out of this group. 
in other words, your card system is sort of fell apart here because you, so many more right. reps will be here. I understand. Than it ordinarily comes. Yeah. All right. Let's let's start on resolution number well, one. Before we get into that, yeah. let me say something. I just want to throw it out for thought. Okay. I know the Mississippi FLCIO don't have the money to do it. I know the CLU don't have the money to do it, or even local unions. But if we could get the talk started on it, maybe get it into the AFL-CIO in Washington. Uh, I'm sure some of them don't thought of it. But we need to get it out to the people of the United States where lots of these benefits that they're receiving now are coming from. Old age pension, Medicare, and all that. we got lots of people that don't realize and don't know. And if we could spend, it would take money to have a one night a week program, maybe hop along Cassidy or what, but a good show once a week and just fill in an ad like they do advertising toothpaste or something that, where this stuff is coming from and what's happening. We get people to watch it and listen to it. But if we just put on an hour program once a year or twice a year, then they're not going to turn and look at it. But if we had a good television program and sponsored by the AFL-CIO just to bring out these things to the public, I think we'd have a better look at it. We may, someone may want to get a resolution that endorse something that says in the FLCIO and they take care of it. As a matter of fact, if any question about it, it's a good thought. But of course, as you pointed out, it's, it's cost that's going to be prohibitive. The only way it could possibly be done would be by the the resolution number one. All of you have got copies of it. Uh, these, the resolution number one and two, frankly, what I did was to write Stanton Smith, the coordinator, who actually is, acts as a clearinghouse, his office does on state council matters, and ask him to submit to us some suggestive language. And the language is language that he suggested. I felt what we ought to do is to get something in there. We would have any trouble getting approved. Uh, resolution number one is actually uh, a manda uh, mandatory uh, change to bring the thing in line with the with the uh, <coughs> rules and regulations. Tommy, you want to read the resolve part of that? Mm -hmm. That's resolution number one. I'll separate the pages here. The resolve on the first. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Section 2 of Article 3 be changed to read as follows. Affiliated local unions in good standing shall be entitled to representation and votes and conventions of the council based upon the average number of members on whom per capita tax has been paid for the 24-month period ending 90 days preceding the month of the convention. The average membership of local unions affiliated for less than the 24-month period prescribed shall be determined by dividing the total per capita tax paid for all months affiliated by 24, and the number of delegates and votes shall be based on such average of members. Local unions affiliating during the 90-day period preceding the convention shall be entitled to one delegate and one vote. And of course, you got your schedule following that, which is just like it's always been. Can you explain that a little bit, Tom? What, uh, LD? Well, what he gets explain down to is at the present time, the votes in a convention is computed on a 12 month period. That's for the carryover when we used to have an annual convention. And what this does here is to change that that you compute it on a 24 month basis. Between conventions. Well, in other words, a uh, <coughs> new union coming into the state, how does it affect that? For the number of months affiliated, if I understand it correctly. Uh, you know, we were working with that one <coughs> local over there, and they said they didn't have no place of all around for two years, damn, they didn't have to be Well, it's 
exercise local unions affiliate during the 90-day period preceding the convention shall be entitled to one delegate and one vote. Now, prior to that, uh, uh, the average membership of local unions affiliated for less than the 24-month period required shall be determined by dividing the total capital tax paid for all months affiliated by 24. In other words, if they've been affiliated three months, you you divide that by by 24. If you give them they've been in is the number of votes they have. Yes, so whatever they're entitled. Whatever they're, they're entitled to. Entitled. Uh, the yeah. others who come in uh, 90 days prior would only get one. In other words, they come in right at the convention or something like that, well, they'd have a full right. time. Right. They'd have a full yeah, time. They'd have 23, 24 months. You divide the, the thing by 24. Depending on the period of time that they were in. Uh, what would happen in the case when it would happen uh, in this particular session of convention? Years since the latest for 24 months yeah. since the latest day of the FBA convention was here. Well, it would still be it would still be divided by 24 based on the on the per capita level. Yeah. This convention would function under the present constitution. Right. Yeah. That's right. right. I know yeah. this one would, but I was speaking uh, yeah. of the future. Mm -hmm. the the next one might be 20 20 next 20. one if he just came in would have full vote. But he's raising well, still another point, and it is a good point. Yeah. What he's saying is that sometimes it's not 24 months between conventions as it has not been this time. So what would happen in a case like this? Say the next convention is 28 months from now, or 18 months from now. Well, I think you divide by the number of votes per capita you have since the last convention. Yeah, of course, what, what, frankly, what he gets, gets to, what he's attempting to correct is the fact that we've been computing it on a 12 month basis, uh, considering the fact that we had an annual convention. So now we're going to buy annual conventions. You can beat it on a 24 month basis. So I would assume it would be 24 months if you would get average it up for the two. You don't have them. But if you had a shorter period of time, I can see where it would be confidential. You don't, you don't have them. Well, it's a 90 days before the convention, so wouldn't that take? No. no. See, the problem is not with new locals here so much as it would be the old locals. You take an old local that's got 500 members, and they've been affiliated the whole time. But say we hold a convention 20 months from now, then under this resolution you're going to divide all of their members in that 20 months by 24. That's no, what this no. says. No, you don't no. that way anyway. That's what it says anyway. That's what it says, but it says 12 now too. Then you'd be reducing the vote of all old, old local unions unless your conventions were two years apart. Well, I doubt that you have a capital union tax union change in payments. I'm bound to have full of an affiliate from year to year anyway. Voting power. During the past 24 months, well, that's, that's, if they were old locals, they were still in there. Yeah. To get, say, your next convention is, was in July of 7. All right, you got to go back three day, three months or 90 days before that to figure your 24-month period. So a local right. would have to have been in from March of 68 this month to March of six of 1970 to get the full right. 24 months. Right. Other than that, it would be prorated. Right. Well, you would, you would, uh, I think it would, not on that basis, be going to use a full. If you use it that way, then, uh, If you use a full 24 months yeah. paid to divide by, it wouldn't affect. You might have to go back a couple of months back in the previous period. Yeah, well, that's, that's what it says. Yeah. This year. You could well, have an overlapping is. period. You could be using the same months for the right, you for different conventions. The last two months yeah, of the other period, the first yeah. two the months of this The cutoff date on this convention was December the 31st right. of 67. Right. So we've got well, that's that's what it doesn't. Yeah. That, that would answer it, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, uh, yeah. All right, do we have any further discussion on resolution number one? Do we have a motion, motion to adopt it? I shall move to it if they require. <laughs> we have a motion to adopt resolution number one. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? Not all in favor of the motion to signify to say an aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carried to order.
so they, so they, they get it in. We can figure it on the reel, the right. regular number one. Right. Yeah. They don't, you know, it's, it's amazing. As long as you go back a full, yeah, full you period, it wouldn't matter. Suggestion is to the devil. Now, that four be it resolved in section two and section six of article 10 be amended to read as follows. Section 2, a local union designed to affiliate shall pay an affiliation fee equal to one month for capital tax. Other subordinate organizations shall pay the annual fee prescribed in section of this article. Section 6A, a local union which has been suspended or which is withdrawn may be reinstated by payment of all amounts due at the time of suspension or withdrawal and for capital tax for the current month. However, the representation and votes to which such local union shall be entitled shall be computed as if it were a newly affiliated local union unless it shall pay the full back for capital tax for the entire 24-month period used to calculate representation and votes as provided in Article 3, Section 2. B, local central bodies and other subordinate organizations which have been suspended or which have withdrawn may be reinstated by payment of all amounts due at the time of suspension or withdrawal and the current annual fee provided. However, that it will not be entitled to representation in convention unless the annual fee has been paid for the two years preceding the convention. The AFL-CIO rules and regulations have outlawed our central state central bodies have outlawed a flat fee to be paid to a state council by any local union. Here in the past, the affiliation fee has been a, a flat five dollars. And the new rules uh, say that it must, that no local union shall pay a flat rate to a state central body. So that's the reason for changing this. To, to read that they shall pay as an affiliation fee uh, an amount equal to one month's per capita tax. In other words, if that month's per capita tax of a local union was uh, $10, they'd pay $10. If it's $15.25 or 20 cents, they'd pay $15.20 as an affiliation fee. But this doesn't change in any way the fees paid by central bodies, joint boards, state associations. They still pay the well, will we and change our uh, central labor union bylaws to the same way now? You should. Again. Probably so, yeah. It probably affects them too. What you probably it's based on the same yeah, flat well, rate. Yeah. Ours is based on the flat rate. Yeah, this is in addition to any for calculus. That's what I want to know. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's going to be pretty good. Well, this is in this addition to the regular for calculus. Affiliation fee computed will be in addition to the for calculus. No, Which means we, really they'd owe two months per capita right. to get in the county. First month. Right. This is right. First, month. first month. You sure you understand? That's that? what it reads. That's what it reads. But I shall pay equal to one affiliation fee equal to one month's per capita tax. Mm -hmm. That's, That's what you call in your affiliation fee. Is one month's per capita. Then month. again, you pay your per capita. What it local union designed to affiliate that. shall pay an, pay an affiliation fee equal to one month. That don't say for capital tax. That's right. It's got to be a separate uh, well, part the capital tax was $10 and they affiliated to April. In other words, they paid $20 That's and right. they have the April pay. That's, That's right. right. Yeah. That's what it's saying. That's the affiliation fee and one month for capital. Which means it's probably well, going to be harder Stanton to get Stanton them affiliated. Stanton Smith will be down here. We'll let him clarify that. I'm not so sure that that's the way it's supposed to be applied. Well, then this needs to be reworded. I think they need it. I think they're supposed to. Yeah, that's what they're supposed Just start off paying for capital tax, period. Strike affiliation fee. Be the first, first month for capital. That's not what this thing says. Well, we'll get that clarified. If it means a month, then that's what it means. It actually costs them more than, uh, than the five dollars. But the rules are strictly prohibit any any flat affiliation fee. You see. Well, this would be a matter of clarification from him. After all, we had him to submit the language. So we're from him. Yeah, you 
you better to either strike that or spell out that this don't mean extra payment, that this is affiliation fee and per capita tax for one month, being the same. Well, do we have a motion to adopt? Uh, let me, let me ask you a question now. Uh, uh, the, the resolution committee is going to be considering these. Uh, know what it means. <laughs> All right, now what? Uh, uh, we ought to have some word from uh, from Stanton well, well, for the committee. Constitutional amendment. Yeah, that's right. Constitutional. He's constitutional amendment. I ain't got no word in it. I really don't believe it should be too much to get in, personally. I, I think it's cut out on affiliation. Uh, I, it's hard enough to get them paying $5 in the first month. they got to pay two full months, and I think it's going to be a little hard to convince them. I think that, uh, that the thing that it actually means that you don't pay any initiation fee, you begin payment of the cap tax period. That's what I think it's going to tell you. If it said that, then we'd be in favor of it. <laughs> I, I don't <laughs> And then a, a new big local, this would make a big difference. Uh, it wouldn't have to stop, but I don't think we could do it. Why not get very Because usually a new local. Uh, don't have much money anyway. And well, it's, uh, well, let's, let's see if we can. Well, yeah, it does, Tom. This is where they affiliate. It's well, kind of. I know, but they've been the newly organized local, uh, the affiliation fee and the cap tax fee. Well, that's what I'm saying. 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 Well, that's Which would mean new organization. Well, let me let's see if we can't dispose of this thing. It's it's the understanding of the board here that uh, that they go along with the resolution if it means paying a month for capital tax and they're affiliated with no affiliation fee. It might be that uh, we need to get this clarified somewhat, and I would suggest that we you have this resolution for the committee that we hold this. I don't see how they could make such a move. Uh, and I ain't going to agree with it if they did. Well, well, you ain't going to agree that it's right. No. <laughs> well, you should have it in there and then the board will waive it. Well, what we've, what we've done, the policy we've got here anyhow is to waive the cotton picking initiation fee uh, on, on your affiliate. See, if it don't apply to new local unions, then you don't even need <coughs> Section 2 at all because Section 6 takes care of local just being in and coming back.
this also says in addition, <coughs> says equal to one month affiliation, one month capital. I tell you what, we could let Tom run over and get a copy of the rules. Let's get, let's get a copy of the rules. Let's lay this one on the table until uh, some of you need to be talking 50 or 60 or 80 yeah, or $100 to have a big meeting. Resolution. Resolution number three. Resolution number three is a constitutional amendment, but it's sent in by the Meridian Labor Council, which means that the board won't act on that. But it's still now resolution one, two, and three has been referred to the Constitution Committee. Let me get my committees right here and advise you what resolutions are going to what committee. Would you like to get you something to write on and we'll go down the line? Uh, you might make a note. You might, you might take your resolutions, it'd probably be as good a way as any, and uh, mark them mark what, commi what uh, committee is going to have them. Resolution 1, 2, and 3 is, has been assigned to the resolution to the uh, Constitution and Bylaws Committee. That's 1, 2, and 3. Resolution number nine to the Union Labor and Label Committee. Which one was that? Number, number nine. nine. been up in Minneapolis. I don't know if she's going to get here or not. She's gonna be here now. He also lost a brother recently. She's got all sorts of problems. Nine, trying to what's what's number nine? Number nine goes to the, to the um, union label. The union label and That's our committee. Labor and Label Committee. <coughs> Resolution number seven oh, to the Social that. Insurance Committee. Which one is that? Number okay. seven. I tell you, it might be easier if I would get my things in order here and tell you where the one, two, and three goes instead of skipping around like this. Well, we'll go ahead and Where does seven go? Social insurance. Social insurance. Social insurance? Yeah. Who's chairman of that committee? Robbins, H.H. Robbins. Well, have you got that one, number seven, the social insurance? Number six goes to the Educational Committee. Who's the chairman of that one? Clark Massey. <coughs> Number eight is L.D. Clark's Committee, the Coke Committee. Number eight? goes to the Legislative Committee, Chairman William Tyler. And 11. We don't have it. We don't have it. I haven't got, got a 10. We don't have a 10. Uh, legislative. The Congress is committing. Oh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, yeah, that's a resolution submitted by Marvin. What is number 11? Number 11 is, uh, Legislative. legislative. It's the only one we're going to take up the ones we're going to submit here this afternoon. Will be submitted in the name of the board. I say that number 10 is a very good and timely resolution. I might read it to you. Let's see here. Do I don't think you can. Number 
four goes to the organizing committee. That's the MHD is chairman. Resolution number five goes to the resolutions committee, Chairman E.B. Edwards. And I understand that some of the groups that have been meeting have going to have a few resolutions that will uh, be introduced. And Brother Edwards, you'll probably get one or two more. Some of the rest of you might be over there. That's number five for the organization. Uh, I mean, the resolutions committee. have two of them. And I believe that takes care of all of them. Resolution number 10, Health and Safety Standards. Whereas Mississippi is the only state in the nation that does not have a Department of Labor or a department to function as such, no state department exists to provide statistical research in the field of health, safety, and construction or industrial employment. And whereas the conservation of fish and wildlife in Mississippi has a high priority than the conservation of human life and health, the current budget of the Game and Fish Commission is $4,798,092.267 full-time and 62 part-time employees <coughs> are employed by it. On the other hand, only two full-time people are employed by the state health department, <coughs> which is responsible for all factory inspection in the state. And whereas every conceivable device has been used by our state in recent years in its feverish haste to attract the industry, bond issues are floated to build and equip plants. Tax exemptions for 10 years are granted these industries, and a right to work law was placed in the state constitution by former Governor Barnett to prevent these plants from becoming unionized. Unemployment and workmen's compensation benefits are the lowest of any state in the nation, and industry is allowed to write its own ticket as far as health and safety are concerned. And whereas in the absence of health and safety standards, working people are daily subjected and exposed to conditions conducive to industrial and occupational disease, they are constantly exposed to dust, acid, gas, dyes, and a host of other materials that prompt occupational disease. And whereas some states have established departments, passed appropriate laws, employed sufficient safety personnel to safeguard their people, but needless to say many have failed to do so. Too many states have abdicated their responsibility to their citizens as has the state of Mississippi. More people are maimed each year by industrial accidents and disease in the United States than in the Vietnam War. And whereas the National Administration has taken note of this disgraceful and inhuman situation and is making effort to correct it, legislation has been introduced which will establish a uniform law of industrial <coughs> health and safety standards. This bill, Senate Bill 2864, is currently being studied by the Senate Labor Committee. Senator Hill of Alabama is chairman of this committee, and Senator Yarbrough of Texas is chairman of the subcommittee which is studying the measure. And whereas a bill has been introduced in the Mississippi legislature which would create a Department of Industrial Relations, if enacted into law, this bill would do much to improve safety and health standards in our state and in effect would improve a lot of the working people in general. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Mississippi AFL-CI <coughs> will stand up and make the convention in passing on March 26, 27, 1968 does go on record in support of Senate Bill 2864 and likewise urges enactment of legislation by the state of Mississippi to create a Department of Industrial Relations 
be in front of his arms as copies of this resolution be mailed to the members of the Mississippi legislature, the governor of Mississippi, and to each member of our congressional delegation, and that they be requested to lend their support to improving the health and safety of our people. Very good. Uh, I think you ought to include in uh, the people who would receive that uh, the people uh, who are on the Arbor's committee that is studying this thing that you mentioned there in, uh, in there. I think the members of his committee, since they are engaged in a study of this, should be informed as to what, the, what our convention goes on record on. Well, let's see if we can't get some of these out anyway as to wait for phone. We'll come back to the, another resolution. Let's take up resolution number four. Uh, who's chairman of all that? Well, the people will ask the chairman of that committee to read that resolution. <laughs> you want to read all of it? Or resolution number four. Or you just want to read the dissolved one? I don't know. You may read it all. It's not too long. Read it all. <coughs> Organizing resolution number four, whereas the major unfinished business of the AFL-CIO and its affiliated unions in Mississippi constitutes to be half to be that of the organizing the unorganized workers of this state. But it is true that several thousand workers have joined our AFL-CIO union since our last convention. It is also true that many thousands do not now enjoy the benefits of the union contract. These workers continue to work for substandard wages, working conditions are bad, and job security is non-existent, and whereas these organized workers pose to a constant threat to the organized, and in many cases actually hold down the wages in certain industrial because of low profit margins. If for no other reason than that of self-protection, these workers must be organized, and whereas we are convinced that the time is right for a total effort to organize these workers, appeals for help come to us contingently, and in many cases we are unable to get the proper unions to provide and organize them. And whereas, since our last convention, the organized department has seen fit to open a full-time office in Jackson and has provided a coordinator and several staff members to assist in a coordinated organizing program. A number of international unions are participating and as a result, an average of over two representation elections per month have been won since our last convention. And whereas the fact remains, many unions with jurisdiction certain industries are not participating in this coordinated effort and others continue to cause jurisdictional problems by continuing to operate independently. <coughs> Up to this point, the session of coordinated efforts can be attributed to a large part of the willingness of various unions to mutually resolve jurisdictional problems. Now, therefore, be it resolved that this convention once again go on record to pledge its full support as well as the resources of the Mississippi AFL-CIO toward a concrete effort to organize the unorganized workers of this state and be it further resolved that copies of this resolution be mailed to each AFL international union with proper jurisdiction in Mississippi and they be urged to join in this effort. Um, We've got uh, a recommendation from the organizer of the park after this resolution was drafted. Uh, so some conversation I had with Bill Kirch and Alan Kiss and Bob and several other people down at, over at Atlanta on a conference they had over there. They uh, wanted to, in the resolution that they wanted to, uh, us to submit to uh, something in there about organizing committees set up by local central bodies. So I'll try to get that with you. And you might want to amend it in committee. I 
What's your pleasure on resolution? Uh, I have a suggestion in, uh, in this resolution somewhere uh, in the resolve. It should be that uh, people who are cooperating in this effort, uh, when they go into the jurisdiction of a uh, central labor union, let themselves be known, and uh, so that uh, uh, so that when questions arise, uh, uh, it's embarrassing sometimes to uh, to, uh, uh, to somebody to come up and say, "Well, what's going on with the organizing effort down at X plant?" Well, I didn't know that there was even anybody in here. I didn't even know there was anybody there. anything going on. You know. Well, uh, that gets embarrassing sometimes to. Uh, to know that there's somebody in your, your, in your area organizing and you're not knowing anything about it. Well, now, if you can spread that over the whole state, I'll be thankful because I have the same experience. It's don't we all? When some international union is working somewhere in the state, we don't know anything about it. Don't we all? have <laughs> an answer to it, I want it. I'm not criticizing your organization in, in, in any way. But I have, I have the same problem. I think so. Uh, a bad idea as chairman of the committee. I don't know if you need to get all these things in the resolution, no. but if, when you no, make the committee's know. report, uh, I think it would be well uh, for you to comment on this briefly. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? They come to me on Wednesday before the election on Friday and ask to put to endorse our neighbor Handel. And that's the tip of Handel. I went down on Thursday afternoon. Well, we've all, I think, had these kind of experiences. We spend all the time here at the state office. It's not anything uncommon for me to pick up a paper and read something about an election and somebody call, somebody call in and want to know what I know about going on down here in such and such plant. We don't have any knowledge. I call Bob. He doesn't have any knowledge. So don't feel bad about it, brother. They're not just shunning the CLUs. They, they, they're not making the proper contact, period. Well, now, that's not the only organization here. <laughs> That's the most recent increase. We're thinking about it more strongly now in the lawsuit. We we'll believe we can change 38 votes and only one. And I fully believe they could have been changed if we worked on it hard enough. Couldn't agree with you anymore. What is your pleasure on this resolution? You want to adopt it as it is, or do you want to change it, amend it, or what? I make a motion to be adopted to the committee. Second that motion. Okay. Any further discussion? Not all in favor of the motion signified to say aye. 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 All opposed, motion carried to so order. Uh, number three is not to be acted on. See so by the door. That's the uh, Brother Knight is back now with the rules and regulations. Regulation, so if you'll, well, we'll go back to resolution number two. Uh, would you like to read the Regulation applying to this situation. The AFL CIO says the following with the reference to the question that we are debating here now. The Constitution or bylaws of each state central body shall prescribe the per capita tax and fees payable to such state central body and the penalties including suspension or expulsion for failure to pay such taxes or fees. The fees of local unions shall be on a per capita basis and shall be uniformly applied to all local unions with no maximum or no minimum and shall be based on the actual number of dues paying members of such local unions. The fees of affiliated local central bodies and subordinate bodies other than local unions 
shall be fixed on a uniform basis, which shall not exceed twenty-five dollars per year. Well, it don't really answer it either. It really don't answer it. So actually, it to be uniform. It actually, this that. is uh, really uh, this resolution based on Stanton's interpretation, right? Yeah. Really, there's nothing in the rules and regulations here that would uh, would necessitate uh, such a well, uh, provision. Yeah. You could set up affiliation. It says it's going to got to be on a per capita basis. That's right. You can't set but it don't say that you got to pay one month plus another one. Well, actually, the executive board has the authority to waive uh, any part of, of, the, of an affiliation fee uh, as far as that goes. I don't know, but very few locals in the last eight years has actually paid an affiliation fee, new, old, middle-aged, or otherwise. We've been so anxious and so hell-bent, so to speak, trying to get them affiliated, but we've gone on our knees to them. Could, be, it could this be changed to work with, or work with just say they start paying the affiliation fee? They're per capita. I mean, paying it per capita. Yeah. Their affiliation, start paying it per capita. Wouldn't have any Well, I, 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 I believe it's... Uh, Resolution would uh, to conform with the rules and regulations would have to pass as it is, and then the board has the authority to uh, to waive that to interpret to interpret and waive the uh, the affiliation. I think that'd be the best way to handle. Well, if you on the market, you could just strike the whole section too. That's the only thing. The local union desires to affiliate shall pay 20 cents per member so that's per month, care of the effective one. as of the first day of month of affiliation. That's the local good. union desires to affiliate shall pay one month per capita tax. Well, it's, it reads now, Carl. An organization desires to affiliate shall pay the current month per capita tax. And it says plus an affiliation fee of $5. That's what we need to strike. If you just track the rest of it and leave the Constitution the way it is, this resolution wouldn't even be needed. In other words, if you uh, deleted section two, section two. Brother Taylor, would you take note of that? Would you will your committee? Show him that now. Okay. This is what you're amending section two. Your organization is going to pay the current month per capita tax, and we just strike that. And this is what they would change. Just have a period is the per capita tax is track plus an affiliation fee of five dollars, and that does. The first section says yeah. it's per capita twenty cents per member. Yeah. If you just put a period out of the word per capita tax and track the rest of that sentence in the old constitution. Yeah. Now the, the rest of it, I don't know why that needs to be changed. Tonight. Put a period right you after the tax. Six and six Carol, put a period right after the tax. Tax right now. Six, section six in the resolution has got to be changed. It's got to be changed anyhow. Uh -huh. Just two just needs to be well, why can't we just amend the resolution then, since the section six and uh, A and B's got to be changed? Why not just change section two to say a local union designed affiliate shall pay uh, the current month per capita tax and end it? Go with that language. Just write it into the resolution. It's already, it's already in, in the constitution. It's section two. Yeah, but I don't know what it is. Really. Section two and put a period right after the word. That's the way it should be. Right after the, the word tax. Just drop it. Plus an affiliation fee. Delete that. No, we need, we need Just write the language in there. We need to write the language. Y'all pay, what would you say, Jack? A months <coughs> per capita tax? The current. Y'all pay the current. Pay the current.
the, the suggested change, section 2 of local union designed to affiliate shall pay the current month's per capita tax. That's the same language in the Constitution right. and drop the rest from that section there and then yeah, we're going to read other subordinate organizations shall pay the annual fee to size these prescribed yeah. sections. Supposed to be one. This, huh? Section one. Section one. Section one of this article. Right. Uh, Section one of this article. Of this article. Uh, the rest of it's all right, isn't it? The rest of it, I, I see. I think it's all right. James, you want to offer a motion? We amend the resolution. I'll make that motion. You got a second? For second. Any discussion on the amendment? Not all in favor of the amendment signify to say an aye. All opposed? Motion carried and so on. Brother Taylor, you got the. That would then read like this. A local union designed to affiliate shall pay the current months per capita tax. Right. Then pick up other subordinate yeah. officers. Right. Strike the. And we're still within their rules because we're right. doing it on the basis of per capita. Right. I think, I think, I think this is the, the, the sensible thing to do. Now, do we have any other? Discussion on resolution number two. You propose to the strike the last sentence? No, no. <coughs> section two is the only one we've done anything with. We we struck the latter part of that sentence. Change it to read as follows: The local union designed to affiliate shall pay the current month's per capita tax period. And then pick up other supporting organizations or pay the annual fee for something prescribed in section one of this article. Wait, wait a minute. Now, my, is it, does it say section one? No, you got to write one in there. We, that was the type of route clear to left it. One out of it. <coughs> All right, we got a motion to adopt resolution number two as amended. I so move. Any further, any further discussion? All in favor of resolution number two signify to say an aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carried and so on. He knew it was the same. We've already we've already adopted resolution number four. Huh? Yeah, we gotta get moving. Resolution number five. Affiliation. Just a resolve. All right, Brother Edwards, Edward, how about you read the resolve for the resolution number five? Now, therefore, it be a re it resolved that the delegates assembled in this fourth biennial convention in Jackson, Mississippi, March 25th through the 27th, 1968, do sincerely call upon uh, those local unions not affiliated with the Mississippi AFL CIO or the local central body to do so at the earliest possible date. And be it further resolved that a list of unaffiliated local unions be compiled by the officers of the Mississippi AFL-CIO, and this list be mailed to the various international unions, as well as the coordinator of state and local central bodies, and that they be urged to uh, use their influence to bring about full affiliation and participation at all levels in Mississippi. Uh, the list of unaffiliated local unions, let me, let me, let me ask a question here. Now, this this has already been done, but I might have already did this. We'll, we'll work on it some more. All right. Uh, uh, I think in addition uh, to uh, the people who, uh, as well as the coordinator of the state and local central bodies, uh, I, I think the uh, local central bodies should be provided with a copy of this list for the uh, for the uh, people who are not affiliated within the jurisdiction of that local cent central body. You mean with the state or with the local central body? No, with the state. With the state. Yeah. Uh, and then we put out a directory that you 
talking yeah. about. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, well, I, I just wanted to. If you check the quarterly standing of affiliates, uh, the ones that are not affiliated yeah. wouldn't actually be there. Yeah, well, so that actually, would be, we do send that, that, that would be. That, that answer the question. Yeah. I, I, I move that uh, for the adoption of this resolution. We have a motion and a second to adopt resolution number five. We have any further discussion? Not all in favor of the motion signify it to say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion carried and so on. Let's see who's got resolution number six. Is the chairman here? Education no, he's committee. not here. For the matter of life, you elected. Again, with the resolve. Let's read the resolve. <coughs> yeah, that's a page and a half. Now, therefore, be it resolved that this Mississippi AFL CIO convention call upon all central labor councils local unions to strengthen their community service committees and further urge the Central Labor Councils to, one, continue to develop their community services program at the local level, a training counselor seeking further representation on the <coughs> health and welfare agencies, joining with other civic-minded groups in the development of new social services, and supporting the United Funds in order to finance local voluntary services. Two, place high priority on the initiation and support of mental health programs designed to meet the needs of workers and their families to include walk-in emergency clinics, child guidance clinics, emergency hospital day and night centers, adequate research, and other community-based mental health services. Three, to fully support all new federal regulations in the poverty area that we support President Johnson in his war against poverty and that we call upon all local labor councils and local unions to work within their communities in this state to develop a program which will uh, seek to assist all deprived citizens and in so doing take full advantage of the Economic Opportunity Act of 1964. Four, engage in activity which helps people who are deprived to organize themselves for the purpose of meeting their needs in the community. Five, our Community Services Committee in cooperation with other groups in the community is working to promote a comprehensive approach to the redevelopment of our community so that they will have housing for all income groups regardless of race, creed, or color, and will have the necessary social services to meet this total community need. Number six, <clears throat> assist in the implementation through our local and state communities of the 1965 Public Welfare Amendments to the Social Security Act with special emphasis upon Title 19, which extends medical care to needy individuals and families and extends and expands existing health programs. Seven, continue to seek representation from the labor movement on all social and physical planning groups, both public and voluntary, in the local community, and take necessary steps to assure that such labor representatives are available and trained to accept and discharge the responsibilities of these appointments. What's your pleasure? <coughs> Resolution number six. covers uh, several different subject matters that, that were suggested by the board at the meeting where we talked about the resolutions and the language was lifted from uh, a resolution adopted by uh, one of our other state organizations that we know where it comes from. A uh, little uh, word of information uh, along the lines of uh, in the Economic Opportunity Act. Uh, a lot of people may not realize it, may not know it, but in the various uh, uh, offices that are set up in the various uh, communities that, uh, that handle these programs, uh, if you go around and look in those offices, you'll find desks and typewriters and what have you uh, that has the uh, United States Department of Labor, property of the United States Department of Labor. Uh, so I think uh, uh, in connection with uh, taking part in these things, we ought to expand the information to the, to the people who might not know that uh, these programs are being uh, uh, are helped 
by the Department of Labor, by uh, uh, people who uh, think along the same lines that we do, and uh, that uh, if it wasn't for the Federal Department of Labor, that uh, uh, these programs probably wouldn't be in existence. I'm not sure that this is pertinent to the resolution, but uh, and this is one thing that's being encountered uh, through uh, organizations or labor unions. Several internationals have gone into areas and pledged to support the program of the hardcore unemployed. As a result of these pledges, we're confronted with a minimum wage, filling some of the same jobs that we've got collective bargaining agreements and wages set on. And we're bitterly opposed to this. We're bitterly opposed to lowering our regulations uh, or job requirements to meet this. Uh, if this is what uh, I'm reading in here, then I would go uh, as opposition to this resolution or for amending, amending this resolution. What about you talking about, Jack? I'm not sure that it's here. What I'm looking at is the is. third I paragraph. Think, I don't think so. To fully support all new federal regulations in the poverty area. Now, this is a federal regulation as I understand, or it could be interpreted as a federal regulation. Uh, it's a federal agency that's supporting uh, this, so naturally sometimes you can get uh, conflicts with interpretations of what's actually printed. Yeah. And in some areas this is happening. Well, I've been in uh, <coughs> one meeting recently in which this matter was discussed quite at length, and it is a matter of deep concern to a lot of people CEO has established a, an office uh, of a kind of a coordinator to work uh, between uh, organized labor and, uh, and the urban development phase of this thing we're talking about. John Livingston, the former director of uh, the Northern Organizing Department, is, is, is the man that's being appointed to that office. Mm -hmm. I uh, frankly don't think that the language here uh, uh, ties us down in the fashion that you're talking about. This question, no doubt, will come up. Because well, this question, yes, and it might be uh, well that uh, that it's discussed from here now that we might have a better understanding of what we're really talking about. Now, I don't think there's any question but what the, the trades are going to have some problems uh, come out of this thing and, uh, along the line that you outlined. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's going to be a real serious problem. But the fact remains that the FFL Seahawks at the national level, plus the Building Trades Council, has, uh, has already signed an agreement uh, of cooperation in this area. <coughs> and it's something that uh, uh, that everybody's going to have on their toes about. Uh, this, this is no different, frankly, than some of the programs we've got going on already. That's our training programs where if you're not careful, uh, they'll be training people who duplicate or take a work uh, at a lower wage than what the established right. rate is. Not anything really new as far as we're concerned. Mm -hmm. We're faced with this and I need to pray in another place else. That's true. Right. We, we would be hit almost as yeah. bad. Right. Yeah. Well, right here in this, it's clear to Father that you don't need committees to help run these programs yeah. and we have a right on them. Yeah. But I'd love to see somebody get one on the cars in Mississippi. We shut two programs down yeah. and they just stopped them because they didn't want labor people on them. And the only way they'll come in there is they even go to keep it out of the news. Jesse Lester, the Labor Liaison Coordinator, Office of Economic Opportunity, and that's the reason we got him over here. We want uh, 
We want to hear what uh, what uh, from him, what uh, you know they can do. And, and, and we want to give you an opportunity to get him off the corner somewhere and tell him about some of these problems. That's the reason we got him on the show. But if, if, if he's like the rest of them, in other words, I'll be up there in a few weeks and I'll look well, you up there and get it straightened out and you'll never hear nothing from him. Well, I tell you, you might think about doing what we did in the Meridian and Hattiesburg situation. We slightly blocked funding of the program <coughs> to those two areas and they could, till they got their board straightened out, didn't we, James? That's right. Didn't, didn't we, Clark? But then they'd come back in three or four months and start it right back. We wrestled with yeah, about two you. years, but we finally prevailed. Back to business, well, I wound up with more job with it than I can afford. I'm the <laughs> vice chairman of the community uh, action uh, program, the president something. of the preschool council, and Lord knows what else. There's something else to but, that. One time you get but started, but once you open the door, you, you, you got to measure up, because it's all dump it right on you when they see you well, work, and they give you every committee they can get you on. I, want, I don't want to leave the impression that we're opposed to the program, or yeah. that I'm opposed to the program, mm -hmm. yeah. but I don't want to adopt a resolution and convention that open the door yeah. to organize labor in the state that any time you got uh, this thing to inject into bargaining unit group that you're going to tear down the bargaining unit for the substandard wage can't do it. and the qualification of people. Right. Well, one approach is this, that the labor department I believe is using at least with the neighborhood youth corps before a neighborhood youth corps is assigned to work there six hours a day to any particular organization that has any labor connections, that organization has to write and explain to the labor department by using these people in this category that it does not change the structure of the wages nor it does not they'll replace any regular people that would be employed in these categories before they'll agree for them to be assigned there. So if you could get such a stipulation in some of these other organizations, then this would, in my opinion, correct the most of it. And if you answer that it will, then they just plain don't agree for them to be assigned on that particular job, you see. You see what will change your mind. <laughs> and then comes in there from Atlanta and stands up there and tells them that they're going to set the program up at this and they don't want to cooperate. That's all right. They do all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he gets up there and pulls the rug out from under and leaves them hanging there. Well, then they cooperate. But I know at least in the Neighborhood Youth Court and Labor Department program, they're doing that now, James. Well, do you want to act on this resolution? As it is, do you want to amend it, or what's your pleasure? Well, I think it needs some action, and I wouldn't know how to amend it to correct the situation that I'm talking about. Well, if you get, uh, if we get considerable discussion, it might be appropriate in time to refer go back to the committee. Right, sure. We have a motion to adopt resolution number six. I move the resolution number six to the adoption of the resolution. Do you have any? Do we have a second? Second. Do we have any further discussion? Ready for the vote? All in favor of the motion signify to say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Resolution number seven. Protection legislation. Could we give that one to Brother Robbins, I believe, wasn't it? I mean, uh, you want to start <coughs> off with the resolve part, Robbins? Now, therefore, be it resolved that this commission does go on record to support the following action initiated by the FLCLO at the national level. One, to seek action to improve consumer credit laws and practices by supporting enactment of truth and lending bill of the legislation to regulate price advertising and permit buyers a chance to change minds on credit purchases. Two, to call for a general investigation by the Congress of the insurance industry, especially credit life, mail order, and auto insurance. Three, to seek action on the pricing practices on key consumer <coughs> products such as prescription drugs and relation and the relationship of food prices and promotion gimmicks. Four, to seek swift action to ensure the safety of consumer products through tightening of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act requirements on the labeling of drugs, cosmetics, and pressurized food containers through 
the updating of a flammable fabric site and by establishing the National Commission of Product Safety. Five, to support legislation to provide consumers with unbiased product information. Six, to promote the establishment of formal governmental machinery to devise and aggressively promote solutions to consumer problems. Be it further resolved that the Mississippi FLCIO and its affiliated organization call upon all interested organizations and individuals in the Mississippi in Mississippi to join with us in organizing a consumer federation to protect consumer interest in Mississippi. Mm. tried to get uh, what was her name called? Betty Furness, uh, but she wasn't one able to be here. Uh, she did uh, she mm. tell us that she'd send this lady and uh, I understand she's a good speaker. What's your pleasure on resolution number seven? Make your motion to adopt it. Motion to adopt by Mr. Brother Robbins. Second. 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 Any further discussion? Not all in favor of motion signify it to say an aye. Resolution number eight, political unity. Brother Clark, I believe you're chairman of that committee. Second. Would you read the resolution? Now, now therefore be it resolved that the delegates assembled in this convention do unequivocally pledge to admit personal comment to any candidate, no political propaganda and work in unity for the candidate officially endorsed by the Mississippi Athletic CIO and be it further resolved that after the election of those candidates endorsed by the label we remain in constant contact with them so they may be informed of our aims and objectives and remind, reminded that they are the servants of all people and be it finally resolved that a copy of this resolution be made available to all AFL-CIO affiliates in Mississippi and urge the full and speedy implementation. implementation. Uh, <clears throat> that one committed the uh, legislature to so heavy by the Central Labor Council so the state don't endorse them. I've got some. He has got better work to uh, resolve after the that would be probably be more appropriate in connection with your central labor union bylaws wouldn't it brother Clark in your own area in other words I don't think uh, even if you had it in here it would be very effective if you didn't discuss it on a local level and probably have a resolution in your central labor union to that effect well I mean this is eight endorsements for that right. in the central labor council right. I mean this resolution don't call for you to support it. you might amend it you could amend it to say that, and I got no this, objection. <coughs> but this uh, resolution, if adopted, be a recommendation to all the CLU. Why don't you uh, amend it in committee, Brother Clark? To uh, uh, you do need something. I agree with him, but without yeah, that, you, uh, you get into all sorts of problems. Yes, let's see. Actually, I have more than mm -hmm. doing. <coughs> right. Because that's where your hottest campaign just really falls on a local level. You can say that again. <laughs> well, for the prayer flag. Am I mistaken in my assumption that uh, any uh, recommendation that is made by your central body on the legislative level is automatically adopted by your state AFL-CIO? That's true, except Brother Clark's raising the question here that this resolution really don't cover local candidates. This is speaking more on a statewide level. Yeah. 
we also need something where come in this resolution right now is for overlapping uh, central labor jurisdictions from one with the other one. Uh, they get together before one central labor union endorses one candidate, one endorses another. We had that to happen. Especially if you're involved in a congressional race. I'm very aware of that. I got a telephone call or two of this up from that. <coughs> from your section of the state. I got several of them. <laughs> yeah, I know. Why don't we pass this one to the committee? Uh, yeah, I, you know, I Let them change we wherever they want to change. this resolution uh, as it is, Brother Clark, and I'd suggest that if your committee wants to get into the central body phase of it, that, it, uh, that the executive board here would have no objection to yeah. it. Yeah, here, right Brother Clark, <laughs> uh, it's been suggested here that uh, that we adopt the resolution as it is, and that the board would have no objection to you amending it, bring it out, seeking political unity at the central body level as well. Uh, you offer a motion. I'll move it. That, that adopt that the resolution. Done, yeah. We get a second to it. Second. Any further discussion? Not all in favor of the resolution signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Number nine, that's Brother Brown, I believe. No. <laughs> <laughs> Brother Brown, you want to read the resolve on resolution number nine on union label and service? Therefore, it may resolve that and the de uh, delegates assembled at the Mississippi F AFL CIL Sports Millennial Convention may affirm their historic support of the, these emblems of top quality union craft, skills, and services. And be it further resolved that the Sports Millennial Convention call upon all affiliates and all customers everywhere to redouble their efforts to look for a union label when they buy and to demand the shop card, store card, and service button when they spend. Now, me and the guy went out to buy union shirts. We found a store that had union shirts. We didn't find a union salesman in town. There we was. They had the union goods, but they didn't have no union men to do work. Oh, wait a minute. <coughs> Some of the larger cities. Yeah, they did. Not in No. Well, no, not here. A lot, a lot of those people over the country belong to our organization in, in the men's shops in bigger cities. That we have in the convention or at hotel. That's true. <laughs> so we we want to have one in a Union Hotel, we'll have to go to your well, you have to go to the <laughs> Yeah. Well, frankly, right. what this does is anything that we'll ever have to think or go to the right work state to have it. <laughs> <laughs> AFLCO has their conventions in my in Florida, Florida. <laughs> just like Mississippi, and I think it ought to be boycotted and stopped too. <laughs> well, I couldn't agree with you anymore. <laughs> Well, if you go down there, don't go to Miami unless you carry a car over the money with you. Amen. All this resolution does is urge our people to practice what we preach. That's the way it gets done. Yeah. It's more or less a standard resolution. Right. Uh, Brother Edwards and I discussed this a good bit over the phone. We didn't have time to get together. And I tried to figure out some way to put in there uh, the only one I could think of where you can't see them. All you do is hear them. That's a telephone operator. You can't see a button or a card or you know where the union not unless you ask them. And you can ask them. And they'll tell you. Some of them live once in a while, but I've been told that they did. But it seems <laughs> about four or five in Corinth uh, that they joined the union where they wasn't before. <laughs> well, Brother Deeds, I'd suggest when this resolution comes up that it be appropriate for you or Brother Edwards or one of you up and, and to make this suggestion. Not only not only that, but uh, uh, I believe in con uh, in conjunction with what uh, Brother Dees is talking about, uh, I think we have uh, people going around and doing jobs all the time. 
Uh, there are union members that people don't know that they're union members. That's right. mm -hmm. uh, uh, they might be a, a telephone That's repairman, or he might be a plumber, or he might be a carpenter, or something uh, <coughs> coming, coming to your house to do some work. Uh, there ought to be some way that you could just look at that person and tell him and tell whether he's a union member or not. Well, uh, and uh, uh, one one way that we have devised for our uh, installers uh, to uh, uh, to let people know is that we've got a little uh, a little pocket folder <coughs> here that we uh, that we uh, give to all of our installers, <coughs> and they wear them in their uh, in their shirt pocket. And when they go, when they go in a place of business or in a grocery store or somebody uh, to uh, to buy groceries or or to go in your house to work on your telephone or what have you, you can look at that person and tell them you're union member. Mm -hmm. Well, that ought to be uh, that ought to be uh, so in all of our trades. Uh, if it's a carpenter, or, uh, if it's a carpenter or whoever he might be, there ought to be some way of telling. That he's a union member. I think we'd all agree with that. I'll make a motion resolution be that. I second it. Any further discussion? Not all in favor of the motion signify it by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Who's got resolution on the left? resolution that we asked Bob Starnes to uh, draft for us on this thing. Well, he wrote one. I know that. I know it too. Two pages long. Who wrote this? Bob Starnes. Well, we set up these subcommittees and run them in got various and sundry individuals to do the work on them. And don't think some of them words are typographical errors because they're not, because that's what they are. In other words, that's the way they just come out. That's the way they fail, <laughs> as I was informed. I just knew that uh, big business, Minions, uh, I've never heard of that. What? Minion, M-I-N-I-O-N-S. -E it's in the third foray. <laughs> Let me, uh, oh, really let's get on with this one. This is going to be a lengthy one. Since I've asked the secondary night to read the last two or three, I'll try to read this one myself with this read to resolve for it. And that's that's sufficient, I think. Uh, he, he really he really did it up front. <coughs> Therefore be it resolved that the following suggestions be considered by the National Labor Relations Board and by the National Congress. Number one, we categorically oppose the abolishment or uh, curtailing of the statutory functions of the NLRB. In order to substitution, therefore, a labor court to assume any part of the board's functions. And I want to pause right here and say that I get Ben Dixon Files is running around the country advocating the creation of a of a labor court. And he and I have had some pretty good arguments in some of the meetings about this. And if the opportunity presents itself, I think that uh, some of you people need to uh, get on him about this thing. Uh, we uh, we need a labor court back by back we need another hole in the head. The labor court turns out to be like some of the courts we've got. We we've, we've had it. I might say Paul just just that they would. Pope has just <coughs> come out with a film on this. Yeah. It's available through uh, our international. We have eight copies. On the labor court idea? Yeah. The labor court idea is being pushed by people like Dirksen, some of the real anti labor members of the Congress. So that's proof enough if you don't need it to me. It's strictly in opposition. Yeah. Adopted position oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, All right, number two. When a committee places an advertisement in a newspaper exhorting workers to vote against the union or in any manner whatsoever involved itself in a labor matter involving an employer and his employees, all members of this supposed committee shall be required to sign the said advertisement. Now, we're talking about these business committees. You know what we're talking so about. So you know who's putting out what. Right. Number three, when any committee, organization, individual, public office holder, newspaper, or other news media injects itself or himself into a matter which involves an employer and his employees in any manner whatsoever, 
then that, that act shall automatically constitute the action of a legal agent of the employer. And that agent shall be deemed to have automatically violated the civil rights of every employee eligible for union membership involved in the matter between those employees and their employer. Employees' regulation and permanent employees and attorneys accepted. Number four, when any public official or law officer shall involve himself in any type of a labor, labor matter, attempting to prevent organization of workers or impede workers' efforts to advance themselves, then that person shall be deemed to have automatically violated the civil rights of every employee eligible to union membership involved in the matter between those employees and employer. Number five, <coughs> newspapers constantly cry for free speech. Therefore, when a paper publishes an editorial or comment and its news columns against the union, that editorial or comment shall be submitted to the union in ample time in advance of publication, and the union's reply shall be published on the same page, same issue, same edition, side by side with the editorial <laughs> comment. <laughs> Number six. <laughs> Number six. Well, it's I all right to dream. I went over this. <laughs> I went over this thing with Bob, and we agreed we was going to do it. We might as well do it up brown. Yeah. And he did it up brown. Mm -hmm. Number six. Number six. Labor consultants have made the Labor Management Relations Act a free employment act for themselves by the practice of delay, fear, intimidation, coercion, misrepresentation, and use of half truths and untruths. Therefore, standards should be established for their practice. Studies should be made of their repeated and almost automatic requests for postponements, delays, and extended time for filing motions, briefs and exceptions, and infinitum. Now, that's the one that Calvin was talking about. Ad infinitum. The files of the board will, will indicate those consultants back? guilty of uh, these practices. And where such actions are excessive or customary, remedial action shall be should be taken. Such actions may be pre-hearing elections, summarily rejecting requests for delays, requiring all contract benefits to be retroactive to the date of request for recognition with seven percent interest compounded each three months. That's a good one. After certification of a bargaining unit. Statutory requirements on meetings for negotiations with the time limits on reaching agreement, number of meetings, and so forth, with all benefits retroactive to the date the union requested recognition with 7% interest compounded each three months. <laughs> of course, you see, uh, again, we're going to do it up front. Mm. This is one of the problems of the lack of penalty in these with these <coughs> SOBs, like out here at Presto, for instance, where they've been certified in a they're dragging their feet and won't agree to even meet, you see, and, and all this kind of stuff. Number seven, <clears throat> since labor consultants secure salary and expense payments made to union representatives, to make this information public, the employer furnished to the union by registered mail and by letter, first class for every employee, the amount of all monies, fees, expenses, or gifts paid or made directly or indirectly to his attorneys or labor consultants, in any labor matter. You understand what we're talking about there? Yeah. This is to be done within 10 days of the request for recognition or on the day such attorney or labor consultant is employed or first gives advice. If the attorney or labor consultant represents the employer in other matters, then the sum total of all such payments shall be made available in accordance herewith. <laughs> Frankly, what this is asking is that the same treatment be given to labor consultants as is given to us under the Landon Griffin Act. And that's what the pass it down back for in the first place, where we'd have to publish our financial status so they could get it for this type business, you see. Number eight, only by the adoption of these and other like suggestions by the NLRB, where possible, and by the National Congress where necessary, will be created the laboratory of pure conditions desirable and necessary in labor matters and remove the fear and eliminate coercion and intimidation created by deliberately and with forethought by most employees and practically all labor consultants for the purpose of thwarting uh, the thinking of Congress and the efforts uh, of the NLRB. 
be it further resolved that copies of this resolution be sent to all members of NLRB, the General Council and the NLRB, all members of the Mississippi Congressional Delegation and to members of the House Education and Labor Committee and Senate Labor and Public Welfare Committee. Respectfully submitted. We got that one page. Yes, it is, Mr. I bet you had to make it. Anybody want to put that in this way? If they do, they can retype it. I just tell you that. Oh, I wouldn't try to amend it. I'll tell you that. Right. I think it's complete. I move its adoption. Was that a motion to yeah. adopt the resolution number 11? It was just get it passed and made law. Yeah. It's just that easy. Got any discussion on resolution number 11? Maybe you ought to recommend it to the board that they stop filling it with truth or something. It's cool and rain and all Yeah, that's one thing. <laughs> Well, there's a couple more that have flown too. Yeah, like a lot of them. Right. Stand you in proud and laugh. Well, that's what they, I made a speech once myself where I pointed this to the youth and the boys and the train and the ground to work for uh, anti labor outfits. We got into discussion on the resolution. Not all in favor of the motion to adopt signify to say an aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carried and so on. Now, unless I've overlooked something, and unless uh, somebody on the board has a matter they want considered, uh, we will take care of our business for the afternoon. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, Claude, I believe there's one matter, unless you've already taken care of it, uh, the matter requiring the boy to compile the news releases at the conclusion of each day. Yes, I, that's fine. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, I don't know whether he's going to be available or not, but if he is, we could certainly use his services. Uh, we've had this problem in the past of uh, the press not giving the convention adequate coverage. We've got this young Bob Boyd who has done quite a bit of work for us. Uh, he's now working for the Dell Democrat Times who told me some time ago that he would be happy to act as a press officer for the convention. Uh, which means at the end of each day he'd write up a summary in the form of a press release and we would then make it available to the, the newspaper. Uh, he called me the other day and told me he didn't know whether he was going to be able to be with us for, for all of the con convention or not. But if he, uh, if he does come, I think it would be a little money well spent. I don't know what it would cost a whole lot for him to take care of it, I don't think. Um, we would not. What'd you say? Who we hire if he's available? I think so. Uh, I'll say. Uh, any further discussion on that? Not all in favor of the motion signified to say aye. Aye. Uh, all opposed? Motion carried and so on. Do you have anything else? Do you have anything that you else can think of? I don't believe Paul Dover. Yeah, we want the full board up on the chairs will be the preliminaries are over with. Uh, I'd like to have you up there for the beginning. Now, after the thing gets underway, you can do what you please, but we'd certainly like to have the whole board up there. I don't know where James can go up there or not. We'll be uh, well enough on the way. He's leaving to his assistant. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, one other thing I might add. There ain't no hope for me. I think Kevin Hurley is there. We've got all of the parlors and everything yeah. reserved for the convention. Mm -hmm. Brother Knight, you can get in no, touch with him if when you get ready to call a, a committee meeting, and, and he'll work out an arrangement for you to have a place to meet. Is that not correct? Right. We've got this parlor, the one over there, the Victory Foyer, and the convention office through Wednesday, day and night. If you want to meet at 3 o'clock in the morning, we'll meet then. We love we do whatever you think. <laughs> Carol, I'm bringing a copy last year. Yeah, we'll try to <laughs> take those up for you. When are they supposed to report? When's Bruce Smith supposed to report? Well, that's, that's something that's else. That's after lunch, the second day, I believe. Need to, I need First to talk. Um, that's I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, what, we, what we'll do, James. Y'all get a morning tomorrow morning. James, if you see on the agenda at 2.10 p.m. around.
around 2 o'clock, oh, we'd my. like to get a partial <laughs> report of the Prudential Committee right. in order that we can adopt the rules and get in a position to start doing business. Now, Martin, uh, on Tuesday morning at uh, 10.45 a.m., we need to take up this uh, Meridian Resolution. Uh, it's supposed to be at... Uh, because uh, it affects you right the, there with me on credentials. It affects the yeah. makeup of the offices. Yeah. If it's adopted, it means you know. If it's adopted, it means there's a change as far as nominations. In other words, this needs to be taken care of as soon as possible. You see, it'll have to be before mm -hmm. the second day of the convention. That's what I'm talking about. We'll have to act on it that morning because nominations come up that afternoon, and this resolution can affect mm -hmm. uh, the the officer situation. So I'd like to. Well, if I could be helpful yeah, to this uh, committee, if we had some discussion out of the executive board on this thing, are you just going to throw us to the wolves, or are you going <laughs> to... Well, uh, well, if you want to, it's all right with me. Uh, I'd like to kind of have some thinking from the executive board about the speaking for the... Uh, <coughs> uh, which kind of resolution number resolution three. Number three. Number, yeah. uh, I'm in favor of it myself, Marlon. I've read the resolution uh, and I understand it. Uh, As I understand it, the only change it makes, I, and I Brother have. Clark worked on it, he can correct me. The way the Constitution is presently written, it says one vice president from each international union is a limit. It also says one vice president from any hmm. central body area is a limit. Now, this resolution would remove the limit in the first case. If you happen to have two people of the same international union located at different parts in the state, it would permit them to serve as vice presidents. And that's all the resolution does. Mm -hmm. well, so one you know. word change it from one to two. Yeah, that's all. In other words, you may have some heirs of the state that's got real capable people, but if they've already got a person serving their organization on the present rules, they are not allowed to also serve. So. There. You're well, still limited on the number you can have years. in total. Yeah. No international union, even under this, could have more than four people serving as officers. Well, the reason I mentioned that, I thought as a rule, sort of a working principle, most of the time we had changes, we cleared it with this body. Right. But uh, seemingly we wouldn't do it this time. Well, uh, Brother Clark brought that thing up. I think it'd be I well. suggested it be submitted by the central body rather than by the state council executive board for a number of different reasons. Yeah. So uh, I'm not even sure that's the solution to the thing. We just felt like it had to be a, a little more leeway. Well, they'll open it up a little, little, little more to what it is. So there's no question of what, what you say is true. Uh, the, the limitation of people from international unions uh, puts a restriction on the, on the number of capable people it can actually serve. Uh, this is what you're really getting at. Well, you right. still, under his resolution, couldn't have but one person serving for, as a vice president from one central body area. You'd still confine it to different areas of the state. Right. He didn't suggest changing that. So. Yeah. This gives you a little more uh, flexibility. You, you would be available then to, as a representative of this group to come to our committee. I think uh, probably the, what you ought to do is invite him to yeah. appear before you. Well, we'll do that right now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's one other question I'd like to ask uh, in connection with uh, the resolution committee. Is the resolution committee in this body, do they present all the resolutions to the convention or does each, uh, uh, does each uh, committee present its own resolution? The committee will present its own resolution. You want to, well, this I, will will announce, I will announce the resolution that's been assigned to, that's been assigned to the particular committees and the committees will consider on to those resolutions. Now, there will probably be others come up that will be referred to, to the appropriate committee. Now, since we've had to, as a matter of necessity, had to set up all these committees, we went through the resolutions and tried to make sure that each committee had at least one, where all the work would fall on one or two. So <coughs> it's restricted in your case that you have to consider constitutional. <coughs> well, couldn't as, the, as I understand the resolutions committee itself, if they so desired, could draft the resolution. Well, if you've got a subject oh, matter yeah. you want to bring exactly. out, this applies to any committee. Right. If there's something you want to draft one on, then you're limited to do so. 
my question was this. Uh, 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 just, uh, I was referring back to our international convention operation, uh, the Resolutions Committee itself in our international union presents to the convention, or in other words, reads and presents to the convention, you know, all the resolutions. Uh, but, uh, uh, well, they, 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 you've got different ways of operating. Yeah, sure, and uh, well, that's what I wanted to get. Well, uh, under, con away under, under, under our Constitution, that, uh, uh, I'm glad that, that way. The, <laughs> that the uh, president of the executive <laughs> board will refer. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Will refer the resolutions to the appropriate committee. That's good. That's fine. Uh, in the case that you're talking about, the resolutions committee would take them all up and itself refer them to the appropriate committee. Right. That's the only difference. That's the only difference. Yeah, that's right. So uh, what we do yeah. is try to spread the work out as much as possible. All <laughs> delegates will not have a copy of the Constitution by law. Yes. They will have yeah. just about yeah. half to they're when you discuss these the resolutions. Yeah. They? Well, they're in the Constitution and bylaws in the Congress. Does not have Along with the yours, don't have mine. Had in there. Yeah, you don't have a Constitution in you. I didn't see it. Yeah, mine was in there. You, didn't get you don't have one. We'll get you one. It was in mine. In no, I don't have one. We'll get you one. Well, Moss is not here. Why don't you pull that one yeah. out here? Morgan's, Morgan's not here. Morgan's out. He won't be here. He's apparently not going to be here. Well, he won't be here. Well, let me say if we've enjoyed working with you. Let me ask this, Charles, before we yeah. adjourn. Do we have uh, a photographer to take any type of picture or some pictures? Or the reason I'm asking, the uh, union label and service has suggested in uh, communication and getting yeah. some material for this for resolution yeah. that we have pictures made of the committee and that will be uh, put in their official news along with this resolution if it's adopted. Well, we can arrange for a photographer. Uh, what usually well, happens I wouldn't want to do that just for that, but I just want well, to... Well, if Bob Bullock come by, it. I'm sure he will with the, with the Clarion Legend.